The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie is the first book in one of the most popular grimdark fantasy series, The First Law. I will analyze every single one of the 45 chapters in this book to see if it lives up to the hype. I've struggled to find a good book club or a discussion group for my reads online, so I decided to create one. Whether you're reading along or just need a refresher on your favorite series, this is your go-to spot. I've added timestamps for each chapter in the description below, making it super easy for you to jump to specific discussions. Your thoughts and insights, I want to hear them. Drop a comment as you read or follow along. For each chapter, I'll give you the briefest summary to jog your memory about what's happening in that chapter. I'll also highlight some standout quotes that really make the chapter shine. Then I'll deep dive into the analysis of the chapter and its characters. And given that we're dealing with a character-driven book, trust me, there's a lot to talk about. When I decided to create a book club video where I reflect on 45 chapters in this book, I didn't know that with 86 pages of notes, this would be the most time-consuming video I would ever attempt. So if you enjoyed this journey through the pages, don't forget to support the video by liking it and subscribe for more content like this. Let's get started. Prologue, the end. In the prologue, Logan Ninefingers battles with some mysterious creatures called Shanka, who are something like orcs. He kills one by splitting its skull with his axe, but it gets stuck and finds himself without a weapon. He ends up being tackled by the dead Shanka's buddy. With his Shanka dangling from his boot, Logan decides to take a leap into the river below rather than die on someone else's terms. His fingers clutched, clutched at nothing. He was beginning to fall. He let go a little whimper. This is the first indication that we're reading something different. Logan is tough, he just split a bad guy's head open and he's whimpering. Once you've got a task to do, it's better to do it than to live with the fear of it. This is the beginning of one of Abercrombie's thematic approaches. Sometimes people do things because they have to, sometimes because they want to, but most often because it's easiest. The key component in this introduction to Logan Ninefingers and the First Law Trilogy begins with the title of the chapter, The End. Is it the end of the story, the end of Logan's life, the end of epic fantasy for the genre reader, or some foreshadowing of things to come? Not surprisingly, I think it's all of those things. Amber Crabby also throws us a big bone in the Shanka. Are they going to play a prominent role throughout the series? Are the Shanka hordes going to invade the Northland only to be fought off by brave knights protecting the innocent? No. The Shanka are a red herring of the highest order. Many books into Abercrombie's world, the Shanka remain completely unexplored. It's the first trope the blade itself thumbs its nose at, and it won't be the last. And also, guess what else? Logan isn't dead. If you're interested in the grimdark fantasy genre, you'll often hear about Joe Abercrombie. Abercrombie is not the progenitor of grimdark, but definitely the iconic practitioner. I personally don't really like the term grimdark. It's awfully misleading by intimating that grimdark is the point of the story. If done right, grimdark is never the point. The themes explored in these stories should be independent of the grit embedded within the narrative. Grimdark is an adjective, not a monolithic classification. In this book, Abercrombie's primary points of view are a mercenary psychopath, a crippled torturer, and a self-impressed noble asswipe. In truth, the First Law Trilogy is a commentary on epic fantasy, and ironically, it all begins with a quote from perhaps the first epic fantasy, Homer's Odyssey. The blade itself incites to deeds of violence. Chapter 1, The Survivors Logan wakes up, surprised to be alive, and heads back to his camp to get two very important items, his boots and an old cook pot. This is probably the most iconic quote in the entire book. It echoes through every bit of Logan's character and to some degree the entire series. You have to be realistic. In Survivors, we get a glimpse of who Logan really is when he isn't running for his life or falling off cliffs. It's not a terribly interesting picture at first glance. He's practical, isn't he? So very practical. Where most fantasy characters would be searching for a weapon, Logan is more concerned with girding his feet and warming his torso. He's less mournful for the loss of his crew than the condition of his old coat. In fact, his greatest expression of pleasure is at the discovery of an old pot, not that none of his mates are obviously lying dead on the cold ground. You do have to be realistic, after all. You have to be realistic is just such a well-thought-out running theme for Mr. Ninefingers throughout the first law. Whether he's actually being realistic or delusional, we'll see. There isn't much else lurking in between the lines here. The opening chapter of The Blade itself is almost simple in its dedication to building the image of Logan in our minds. Abercrombie makes us think of Logan as simple or barbaric or both. Will that hold true? We'll see. Chapter 2. Questions Inquisitor Glockta, a man crippled beyond belief, begins torturing a confession out of a representative of the Guild of Mercers. He's interrupted by his boss and scolded for being overzealous in his pursuit of the merchant class. He escapes with a warning before his super big boss shows up and demands he make the Mercer implicate the master of the mints. 
These two quotes, two pages apart, are such a delightful demonstration of Abercrombie's writing. If Glocktick had been given the opportunity to torture any one man, any one at all, he would surely have chosen the inventor of steps. And if Glocktick had been given the opportunity to shake the hand of any one man, any one at all, he would surely have chosen the inventor of the chairs. By creating these devices within the text, he says to his reader, pay attention not just to what's happening, but how I'm saying it. And this is not often the case in much of fantasy. Another example, is this where I beg for mercy? Is this where I crawl on the ground and kiss your feet? Well, I don't care enough to beg and I'm far too stiff to crawl. Your practicals will have to kill me sitting down, cut my throat, bash my head in, whatever, as long as they get on with it. That's Glogda for you. Amber Crabbie gives us a man who truly has nothing to lose. Death would be a relief from pain. What is such a man capable of? Glockta's constant internal dialogue is hilarious. Glockta's pretty screwed up, right? His legs barely work, he's missing all kinds of feet, his spine is crooked, and he's got some severe nerve damage, all thanks to the mysterious empire who's at this point unnamed. Glockta apparently fought rather bravely in a war between the Union and the Empire before he was unceremoniously dumped into the Inquisition. And now they're pissed because he's too good at his job. Well, welcome to the Union, I suppose. Intermixed with all this delicious character building, Abercrombie also begins to roll out something else. Ruse is reportedly engaged in avoiding taxes and it appears that Superior Kalein is also involved in this illegal activity. Meanwhile, Arch Lector Sol seems to be acting in opposition to everyone else involved. So something is afoot in Adria, but what? Beyond the plot, Abercrombie begins to unveil the world to us bit by bit. We have Anglin to the north, a filthy sink of violence and corruption to hear Glockta tell it. We also know Logan is up north. The Inquisition itself raises some intriguing questions of its own. Each Inquisitor seems to have a pair of practicals, who at least for Glockta exist as extensions of his will, the power behind his punch. They wear masks that hide who they are, while the Inquisitors openly flaunt their affiliation. It's pretty clear why a lot of readers immediately latch onto Glockta. From the get-go, his constant jabs at the world, his situation, and everyone around him hit a lot of my humorous notes. I still wince and then chuckle as we get Glockta's first encounter with Stairs in the book, an adventure. We don't meet any truly black or white characters in the first law, and Glockta spends a lot of his time further in the darker shades of gray than the lighter, and yet we see through his cynical worldview in running commentary what could constitute the voice of reason. Maybe that's why Glockta tends to stick out as a favorite character for readers of the series. He's so contrary, he knows and says to himself what is right and wrong, and then goes and does what's wrong because he's told to. He doesn't particularly enjoy anything he's up to in the book for the most part, and he tells you that he doesn't and why it's messed up, and then he grabs something and starts maiming folks because it's his job. Chapter 3, No Choice at All Logan reminisces about the past, hunts for food and smokes something, after which he is visited by three spirits who warn him of a magus seeking him in the south. With his friends dead, Logan finds the spirits have given him a purpose. He will head south to seek this magus. Spirits cared little for the business of men. They were always weak on the details. Still, this was better than the usual talk about trees. They just made me laugh, it's so random. This is probably one of the oddest chapters in the entire book. Logan communes with spirits, but are they real? This is something to watch for as we work through the book. How many supernatural forces are actually at work here? We're also given a look at Logan's past for the first time. His family was killed by Shanka. He refers to himself as the Bloody Nine. The spirits mention Bethod, who has a golden hat and is a king in the north. Logan is familiar with him in a casual way, making us wonder who Logan is in the grand scheme of things. Clearly a man with a reputation, a man who has songs sung of him, but perhaps not a man you want to share space with. Chapter 4, Playing with Knives. Giselle then Luthar beats his fellow officers in a card game before heading off to fencing practice with Lord Marshal Varuz. Despite Varuz's warning to the contrary, Giselle gets very drunk that night, running into Glockta as he arrests the Master of the Mints. These two quotes are perfect in summing up the kind of man Giselle then Luthar is. Yes, the money was certainly useful, and there's nothing half so amusing as humiliating one's closest friends. And the prince's entourage of dandies cheer and shouted half-hearted encouragements at his receding back. Bloody idiots, his Giselle under his breath, but he would have loved to be one of them. Giselle is a jerk. He's a rich, self-oppressed captain in the king's own whose commission was bought and paid for by daddy. His friends are treated like servants and he does not appreciate the man under his command. Sounds like a peach. Amber Crombie has set up a paradigm where his most likable character, the one most likely to be considered a good guy in the early going, is the crippled torturer. 
Giselle's competition in the contest, or at least primary competition, is Bramar dan Gorst. According to Crown Prince Ladislaw, Lord Marshal of Ruse, and Giselle's own thoughts, Gorst is favored and to be feared. By contrasting Gorst to Giselle, we're led to believe that Giselle is a master fencer in his own right, albeit not one terribly concerned with being the best. He's obviously someone born with natural talent, but never having to work hard for it leaves him, well, short of excellence. On his run through Adua, Giselle sees a statue he identifies as the Magus Bias. I can't help but make the connection between Bias and the Magus looking for Logan. They may not be the one and the same, considering Bias has a statue that usually means you're dead, but there's definitely some connection there. We also get mentions of three places I want to know more about, the Agriant, the House of the Maker, and the Lord's Round. I strongly suspect all three places will be significant in the days ahead. There are also a ton of hints in this chapter. We finally learn that the mysterious empire that tortured Glockta is the Gurkish, and that Major Colin West served in the army with Glockta. There are also indications that Glockta was a great fencer in his day, making me wonder if he indeed won the contest that Giselle is now training for. Most significantly, we see legitimate fear in West when he encounters Glockta, not only because of his disability, but because of the kind of man he was and what he's become since. This is also the first interaction of Glockta with people who aren't either his superior, employee, or victim, and Abercrombie does a great job of making him both terribly witty and self-deprecating. He spends a lot of time thinking about how his life can't get any worse, but I can't help but get the impression that some of it is a farce. He still can take joy from witticisms and outthinking others. There's something terribly freeing about being at rock bottom for Galacta. After having read the entire book and coming back to this chapter, Giselle looking at the way people smile and deducing their entire personalities in this chapter is a total farce. Giselle is a screw-up. He's deluded and self-centered. The point of view in this chapter is his. He thinks he's an amazing card player, fully aware of the nature of all the people around him, when really he's completely devoid of awareness as to how pathetically shallow and vapid he is. In short, Abercrombie writes points of view with commitment. Nothing in Giselle chapters reveals anything that isn't warped by his nobleman's bias. It's true of everyone in the book. They're all so caught up in their own heads that they can't empathize, even for the reader's benefit. Everyone except one character, but we'll get to that later. Chapter 5. Teeth and Fingers Glockta extracts a confession from the Master of the Mints by chopping off his fingers an inch at a time with a very sharp meat cleaver. Nothing significant really happens in this short chapter. This is the first and probably the only chapter where there's not some awesome turns of phrase that deserves praise. The only significant thing happening in this chapter is that Abercrombie gives us a peek at the power structure of the Union. Although we're aware that the nation is ruled by a king, Teufel doesn't threaten to go to the king, but to hide Justice Morovia. So we really don't know what political structures are at play here. I suppose we also learned that Glockter is really good at his job, but I feel like this was pretty well established in his previous two appearances. All in all, this is a strange chapter. It could be cut from the novel and explained away in a single sentence later. That said, it's a pretty great demonstration of how screwed up Glockta is as a result of the Gurkish ministrations. We are about to the point in Joe Abercrombie's The Blade Itself where things begin to take shape. Up until now, the novel has been focused entirely on building characters, introducing the individuals to whom the reader must begin to find affinity. Chapter 6, The Wide and Barren North Logan Ninefingers waits in a dreary part of the world for the purported Magus to find him. Instead, he gets Malachus Kwai, an altogether unimpressive Magi apprentice who offers to deliver him to Bayaz, first of the Magi. I am from the old empire. Logan had never heard of any such place. An empire, eh? Well, it was once the mightiest nation in the circle of the world. Not a terribly riveting piece of dialogue, but it's the first time we learn the name of the world we're inhabiting. Circle of the world, it is. There's also an old empire, which isn't so empire-y anymore. We'll pay a visit there later. So I spent seven years studying with Maester Zacharias. He's a great among the Magi, the fifth of Juvens's twelve apprentices, a great man. Everything connected with Magi seemed to be great in Kwai's eyes. He felt I was ready to come to the great northern library and study with Master Bayaz to earn my staff, but things have not been easy for me here. Master Bayaz is most demanding. Juvens seems like he's an important figure in the circle of the world. This is the first mention of him, and we want to pay attention to all three of the names mentioned in this passage. Although Bayaz is the only one with major screen time, how the Magi interact with one another off the page is one of the most intriguing subplots of this series. While this is a fairly lengthy chapter, the first several pages and the last several pages are mostly texture. Book ended by Logan surviving, once from nature and once from thugs. The middle section unveils some serious world building. We're given a peek into how the characters conceptualize the world around them. There's an old empire, a great northern library, 12 apprentice magi to Juvens, Bayaz Zacharias, who now have apprentices of their own, such as Malachus. 
Also, Logan can store fire spirits under his tongue. Pretty awesome, right? And he can summon spirits who give him life advice. He sounds pretty shaman-like. He also enjoys headbutting. It's a weird combination, we're still unclear on who or what Logan is, but let's see how often he does these sort of things from this point forward. There's a fun moment when Malika Squai shows up, Logan asks him, shouldn't you have a staff? It's a typical jab at the wizard in a tower trope that's pervasive in the epic fantasy genre. Hilariously, as the chapter goes on, Malikus admits that he gets a staff once he becomes a full magi. Classic example of Abercrombie upsetting tropes and then reconfirming them. It's great fun to watch him continually work around his reader's expectations. In the end, the wide and barren north presents a lot more questions about the world. There still remains no major plot to speak of, but it's pretty clear that Baez has some intentions for Logan. We're getting into a few world-building chapters. They are a bit awkward at times in how Abercrombie uses the opportunities to build out the structures he needs to tell the story, but he always seems to provide some character development concurrently, making them more bearable. Chapter 7, Fencing Practice. Giselle struggles in a sparing session with Major Vest, the pair take a walk after practice, discussing the likelihood of war. They end up back at West's home, so Giselle can distract West's sister, Artie, while he gets some work done. Notable quotes, it was a flurry of conversational blows, and as Marshal Verus had pointed out earlier, his defense was weak. And the artless ways of a country girl, but then she was very close, if only she were a little less attractive or a little less confident, if only she were a little less West's sister. Two very interesting quotes so far as Giselle's interactions with Artie go. He's confused by her in every way, but finds himself attracted to her. Their interactions are one of the more difficult parts of the novel to deal with as things progress. Yes, in the Dark Ages, before there was a union, Herod fought to bring the three kingdoms together. He was the first High King. Not particularly memorable, but very important to note two chapters from now. Several important things are hinted at in this chapter, most of which are presented to Artie by Giselle during their walk. It's a ploy by Abercrombie to give us some world building under the auspices of character development. Artie is toying with Giselle. Through that interplay of dialogue, she makes him feel interesting and smart, and Giselle tells the reader about High King Herod and his most trusted advisor, Baez. And this is Baez, the first of the Magi. Yes, he was Herod's most trusted advisor. Is it true they still keep a vacant seat for him in the closed council? Giselle was taken aback. I'd heard that there's an empty chair there, but I didn't know that. Later, a similar exchange takes place as it relates to the House of the Maker. Does no one go inside? No one, not in my lifetime anyway. The bridge is kept behind lock and key. The place is sealed, I believe. In both of these cases, Amber Crombie is giving his reader something like Chekhov's gun. These passages seem like filler world building, but are in fact early hints that both Baez and the House of the Maker will bear some relevance in the chapters to come. Glockta's appearance in the chapter continues to further the comparison between the man he is today and the man he will become. Giselle clearly represents who Glockta once was. A brash fencer of great skill from a noble family, confidence and eagerness for the fight are both hallmarks of Giselle's character. Artie's remarks at the end of the chapter would lead me to believe Glockta was once much the same. He used to fence with my brother every day, and he always won. The way he moved, it was something to see. Sandan Glockta. He was the brightest star in the sky. She flashed her knowing half-smile again. And now, I hear you are. In the opening of this chapter, we gain further insight into Giselle's character, and it's far from flattering. His smitten demeanor when interacting with Artie reveals a stark contrast between his internal bravado and reality. This discrepancy further underscores his arrogance and its failure to manifest in reality. The Morning Ritual Glockta's life really sucks. After getting out of bed covered in his own excrement, he's called before the Archlector to be appointed as Inquisitor exempt and assigned a task of destroying the Guild of Mercers. You have to learn to love the small things in life, like a hot bath. You have to love the small things when you have nothing else. In the previous chapter, I mentioned that Giselle is as Glockta once was. This quote will give us some hints as to who Glockta might become. In the open council, the noblemen clamor for ancient rites, while in the villages, the peasants clamor for new ones. He gave a deep sigh. Yes, the old order crumbles, and no one has the heart or the stomach to support it. We are in a time of change in Adua. The Archlector wants to be the impetus behind that change to preserve as much of the old order as he can, and this is significant. So, now the reasons behind Sep Dan Teufel's forced confession become quite clear. Archlector Salt is playing the long game, and Glockta is right in the middle of it. 
With Teufel disgraced and possibly shipped off to England, the way is clear for Saul to put someone on the close council that suits his needs. But the plot doesn't end there. He also has an agenda, one that perpetuates the nobility as the sole arbiter. He needs Glockter to put things in order. He needs someone who does not fear the superiors or the merchants or even the close council. Glockter can be relied upon to act with subtlety and discretion and ruthlessness. His loyalty to the Union cannot be questioned and he'll answer only to Salt himself. Salt's insecurity stems from the war with Gurkish, the same war that left Glockta crippled. Westport, a recently joined member of the Union, swung the war in their favor and was brought in by the Mercers. They were rewarded with trading rights, which allowed them to jump the system to be on par with the nobility in all but name. Salt wishes to use that to cement his own power, to use Glockta to leverage the Mercers and the ruling class. It all sounds a bit mundane, doesn't it? Simple politics of the dirtiest sort by the Arch Lector. Are we seeing the whole picture or is Salt still playing Glockta? It's unclear at this point. Morning Ritual begins as a character study of Glockta and turns into something of an info dump about the political conditions of Adjua and the Union. Where it leads remains unclear. While these last two chapters are focused on world building and while I'm not thrilled with the execution, if we contrast this type of world building to what you'd find in an average fantasy novel where the first chapter or prologue is just an impenetrable wall of incomprehensible names and you're expected to remember and refer back to all these names over and over throughout the series, then I'd gladly take this. It just goes to show how important diegetic exposition really is and kudos to Abercrombie for doing it in such a way that it almost seems invisible, even though the names we have to keep track of are slowly stacking up as well. Chapter 9, First of the Magi. Logan Ninefigures drags the very ill Malika Squire to the Great Library, leaving behind his pack, Cookpot included, where they meet Bias. As the pair trail the markings that lead them to the library, Quai became lucid for a moment. He admonishes the Northman, claiming that to speak with spirits is forbidden and that Logan must not do it. As Logan and Bias get to know one another, Bias is paid a visit by Bethod's youngest son, Calder, who is scared off when Bias flexes his magical might. Quotes to remember in this chapter, at least it has stopped raining. You have to learn to love the small things in life, like dry boots. You have to love the small things when you've nothing else. Remember in the previous chapter when I talked about how Giselle was the man Glockta used to be? I wonder if this quote is a hint that Logan is the man Glockta is becoming, one with nothing to lose and a crushingly practical sensibility. Abercrombie uses the same line in both their points of view. You have to love the small things when you've nothing else. Interesting. One quote stands out to me in this chapter, hard words are for fools and cowards. Calder might have been both, but Logan was neither. If you mean to kill, you're better getting right to it than talking about it. Talk only makes the other man ready, and that's the last thing you want. Earlier in the chapter, Malika's squire hints at a first law and then warns Logan to not do forbidden things like communing with spirits. Now, Bias indicates that magic is leaking out of the world, which would support Logan's deduction during his spirit encounter that this would be the last time the spirits would appear. The magic leaks out of the world. That is the set order of things. Over the years, my knowledge has grown, and yet my power has diminished. What does it mean? We're not sure yet. More and more, I'm starting to recognize the rhythmic nature of Abercrombie's writing. He focuses on certain turns of phrases or items and uses them throughout the chapter. In First of the Magi, it's Logan's pot. First, we see him leave it. They'd been together a long time, but there was nothing left to cook. Then we see him emote at its loss. The pot was sitting forlorn by the lake, already filling up with rainwater. They'd been through a lot together, him and that pot. Fare you well, old friend. The pot did not reply. Finally, we see him remember the pot. Kwai had been an unpleasant place between sleep and waking since they left the pod behind two days before. The pod could have made more meaningful sounds at that time. These kinds of beats within the chapter lend a great deal of connectivity to the prose. Then when he uses lines like you have to love the small things in two chapters, it creates a dynamic symmetry for the reader to connect the dots. We saw in No Choice at All chapter that despite all of his hardness, Logan's regrets have a tendency to sneak up on him and weigh him down. He in fact has a bit of a pity party for himself at that point, but even then he's quickly past it. The choice between living and dying, that's no choice at all. But here we see him take a moment to say goodbye to his pot, and it struck me as being almost a proxy of his family and friends he's lost to the north. Despite the scene being between Logan and an inanimate object, it's probably one of the more touching scenes in the book. Who knew you could ever have a Poignant moment with a cookpot, right? 
Speaking of poignant scenes, something that can be considered as the most poignant scene thus far, Logan on the shore of the lake telling Kwai he won't be able to leave him any food. Kwai is dying and Logan has been shown already to be a hard man, a killer and a realistic person. The conversation between Kwai and Logan as Logan prepares to make the last leg of the journey is expertly set up to take advantage of our knowledge of Logan to assume he's leaving the young man to die. Not sparing him any food or water seems a little overly cruel, but that's when Logan picks him up and slings him over his back. I need all the food if I'm going to carry you the rest of the way, he says. It seems like this, where Logan continually subverts our expectations to do something surprising that make us unable to read into a somewhat one-dimensional view of him. He's a brutal man, but from his point of view, most of his brutality has been forced on him. It's the unreliable narrator trick of choice and his own skewed view of the events in his own life that make us constantly shift our opinion on him from hero to villain and back again. In this chapter, we also finally hear from Baez. He's been mentioned a dozen times by different characters throughout the book thus far, but he's been something of a blank slate. No one really knows anything about him, and many consider him a relic of the past. What we know of Baez and the Magi is, Baez isn't some wizened old man. He does have magic, which he uses to choke Calder. He's got something of a bad attitude. There was once a man named Baez who advised the first king of the Union. His magic is weaker now than it once was. He was apprenticed to Juvens, who once had 12 apprentices. Baez considered himself beholden to Juvens, but no longer with Juvens dead. Zacharias, Kwai's former master, is one of the 12 in addition to Baez. Chapter 10. The Good Man Major West stands guard over Lord Chamberlain's Hoff's audience. Hoff does not show any respect to the Mercers, a delegation from the King of the North, Manbethod, a peasant, and finally Yoru Sulfur, a magi sent to herald the return of Baez to the closed council. Important character introduced here is Fenris the Feared, a member of the delegation sent by King Bethod. Quotes to remember, if you could have stabbed someone in the face with the phrase good day, the head of the Guild of Mercers would have lain dead on the floor. Just a great visual, isn't it? A lot of otters rely on more florid prose to communicate lush imagery. Abercrombie finds a way to do it colloquially. His staff was not shot with gold, had no lump of shining crystal on the end. His eye did not flare with the mysterious fire. I think we get it. Magi aren't really that cool looking in the circle of the world. This is one of those times where Abercrombie is probably being a little too overt in his commentary and sarcasm. Well, in a chapter titled The Good Man, Abercrombie gives us a rather lengthy view of quite the opposite in Lord Chamberlain Hoff. He shows blatant disregard for anyone who doesn't threaten his position, and then bends for a delegation from the North that he sees as a reasonable bunch of savages. He mocks the Magus until given the kind of proof that brooks no argument, and then treats the soldiers around him like servants. Juxtaposed is Major West, who witnesses all of this with a sense of unease and gifts the most aggrieved petitioner money a limited resource for the common soldier. This is the first point of view chapter for West and it shows him to be much closer to the ideal fantasy hero readers have come to expect. He empathizes with the common man and seems genuinely concerned about the well-being of the Union despite clear evidence that the government is failing its people. More than any chapter to date, the good man begins to initiate several plot points. The Mercers have reacted to Arch Elector's assault and Inquisitor Glockta's assaults. The Northmen are about to make their intentions known. Meanwhile, we learn that the government is completely dysfunctional and could become more so if some Magus decides to reclaim his former place in the Union. Abercrombie gives us the peasant to show the government is broken, the Mercers to show the conflict between the nobles and the merchant class, the Northmen to show future conflicts central to the plot, and Euro Sulfur to continue fleshing out the world's backstory and setting Baez up as an important character. As for that backstory, it seems to be increasingly likely that Baez in the Great Library is the same man with the statue in Adua. We know two students who claim to have studied under him, Yoru and Kwai, and in the Good Man chapter, Yoru clearly draws a parallel between the statue and the man who taught him. Chapter 11, on the list. Sent to arrest Mercers implicated by Salem Ruse, Lockto finds his marks murdered before he arrives. Suspecting a conspiracy from within the Inquisition, Arch Lector Sold gives him the authority to conduct a sting to catch the culprit. This also speaks to Glockta's character about how he's continued to serve despite his tortured body. What a useful fellow he is. Without him and Frost, I am just a cripple. They are my hands, my arms, my legs, but I am their brains. He finds pride in his mental fencing as much as he ever did in his actual sword work. Right from the start of this chapter, we see Glockta pulling this why me routine, but a few sentences later admits to himself that he's drawn to do these things with an almost masochistic longing to feel alive again. 
And therein lies the duality of Glockta's character, something that we haven't really touched on all that much. He looks at his past self with envy, hates what he has become, but even when he says over and over again that he wishes it was all over, we see that he can't help himself but to slip off on another painful adventure with his practicals even when he admits to himself they don't need him along for the ride. For all his whining and complaining, he enjoys the pain to a certain extent and to an even further extent a chance to flip the bird to the world and anyone else who might be watching. Glockta might admit to himself that he's a wreck, that he's physically incapable of most of what life throws his way, and he's more than willing to rub it in another person's face if it will give him an advantage, but the second it's pointed out to him by someone other than himself, up go the walls of sarcasm and hostility and he's off to climb those stairs like they're a mountain just to prove that someone wrong. That total lack of self-preservation, coupled with his perverse need to slap the world in the face every time he looks at him as cute just makes me root a little harder for him with every example we're provided with throughout the books so far. Just a bit of world building as it further demonstrates the continued decline of the Union as any kind of functional government. The commoners are up in arms again near Keln. Some idiot of a landowner hangs a few peasants and now we have a mess to deal with. How hard can it be to manage a field full of dirt and a couple of farmers? You don't have to treat them well just as long as you don't hang them. It seems to be a government on the edge of collapse, pressured from all sides and rotten within. This chapter is a tight point of view on Glockta dealing with his own problems, however it does begin to flesh out the Mercer-Inquisition conflict which, to be honest, continues to feel a little thin. Archlector Solt clearly wants to upset the status quo due to his disdate for the bourgeois, but it's not clear is on whose orders Solt is issuing his commands. Is it his own agenda, the king's, the closed councils, or is there another force at play here? Which begs the question, if Salt is willing to throw innocent people under the metaphorical bus, how much of a chance does our intrepid Inquisitor Glockta stand if he upsets Salt? That of course leads me to another discussion point. How well would these Glockta chapters read if he wasn't under constant duress from the threat of death at pretty much every turn? Abercrombie walks the tightrope very well and it's easy for readers to see that if Glockta takes one step out of line, he'll be getting his mostly exaggerated death wish fulfilled, courtesy of the High Inquisitor or the ever-growing list of characters who wouldn't mind killing him themselves. But if it wasn't for that built-in suspense, would Glockta have made quite the same impact as a character? As the chapter closes, we get some more quiet musings from Glockta along with a few more of his witticisms. Broken hearts will heal, but broken feet never do. As he watches the normals go about their lives in the park, with more than a little regret on his part even if he despises them all in his mind. This is why Glockta is great. This is quite obviously a world where morals are only for show. Glockta being Glockta is self-aware enough to know exactly how terrible he is, but cynical enough not to lose a lot of sleep over it. That's why all the really great social commentary in this series happens during his chapters. If we had to read this kind of moralizing from a saintly character, we'd immediately balk at it, finding it heavy-handed and a little too preachy, but when the nastiest character in a book full of nasty men takes the time to notice that things are wrong, we sit up and take notice as well. It's also important to realize that Glockta, having lost forever the heroism he felt was his due, has consciously decided to become the villain everybody sees himself to be. Chapter 12 An Offer and a Gift Scolded by both Varuz and West for his fencing, Giselle leaves the practice field to stand guard at the open council. Chamberlain Hoff continues to make an ass of himself, King Gustav arrives, two Northmen are announced, White Eye Hensel and Ferenc the Feared. Hensel brings tidings from Bethod, King of the Northmen, offering peace in exchange for the city of Angland. As the room erupts, Fenris removes his cloak, revealing his massive frame and the tattoos covering half his body. He stabs himself in the arm with a dagger and challenges anyone in the Union to fight him for Angland. Giselle mounts off, but Hoff orders the matter closed. Hensel says three signs will herald their message from Bethod and the pair leave. The Union may soon be at war. He could have said more, but he was damned if he was going to make all the effort. He gave a thin smile, so did she. The conversation hovered over the abyss. I just love this quote, how many conversations have gone this way in your life. He had great low jowls and a roll of fat around his neck. In fact, his whole face gave the appearance of having slightly melted and started to run down off his skull. Such was the high king of the Union. But Giselle bowed his head a little lower as the palanquin approached just the same. Great description of the king as well. This chapter is one of Captain Giselle and Luther's chapters. Logan and Glockta have worldviews. Their points of view offer insight into both the working of Abercrombie's world and themselves. They are self-aware, deluded, but in a way that makes hearing about events from their perspective interesting and engaging. Giselle, not so much. 
To be frank, there's very little interesting and engaging about Jazal at all. His chapters are filled with whining about how the world isn't fair, except he's been given everything, from his tobacco to his steals. Jazal hasn't had to struggle for anything in his life. Where Logan and Glockta have things to actually lament and often excel in spite of their misfortunes, Giselle's laments are invented. It makes his chapters annoying, a little boring, and at times a struggle. I also think Abercrombie does this intentionally. He does it to say to his reader, you know that guy you read about for the last 20 years, the guy with a sword who cuts a dashing figure and seeks glory and wants to be recognized? He's a jerk. However, once we grasp that the characterization is intentional, it changes our perspective. Of course, he's shallow and vain, very much a spoiled brat. So far, he hasn't faced events that truly test the beliefs he grew up with. His introspection is more surface level akin to looking in a mirror. However, similar to Glockt and Logan, there's an underlying decency in him. He's often caught off guard by his own thoughts and reflections that don't align with his preconceived notions about himself and the world. I look forward to observing this growth. An Offer and a Gift is a chapter of three sections where all three offer a tremendous amount of foreshadowing. The first section is Major West reacting with evident unease and lack of grace. This marks the first instance where we witness West's reaction deviating from his usual demeanor described in the Good Man chapter. Abercrombie seems to be using him as the everyman archetype, Mr. Likeable, if you will. Between his reactions in this chapter and his constant fretting over Artie, I'm beginning to question whether they will hold up. In the second section, Lady Aris is exactly the kind of woman Giselle's personality would lead us to believe he would find irresistible, rich, noble, and insipid. Yet he dismisses her as irrelevant. He never compares her directly to Artie, but it seems implied. Is Giselle infatuated with a commoner? Finally, the last section. This isn't the last council meeting we'll be watching, not by a long shot. Unfortunately, many of these scenes are told from the perspective of an observer. Giselle, West, Logan later. And not a participant. It makes them overly dry and rather repetitive. The primary takeaways are the foreshadowing of the Degoska situation and Fermer's going nuts. While everyone's attention is on Bethard and Ungland, the Degoska representative makes mention of the poor condition of the city walls. Abercrombie doesn't do a lot of extraneous world building for its own sake, so the assumption is that we have to pay attention to these sorts of lines. As for Fenris, he seems to feel no pain and possesses some capacity to instill fear. All of that combined with half of his body covered in blue runic tattoos would indicate that there might be some magic at play. Chapter 13, The King of the Northmen. Logan reminisces about being a bastard, gets a sword from Bayaz, and ends up in a staring contest with Bethod and his entourage. Bayaz sends the King of the Northmen scurrying after rejecting Bethod's overtures of friendship. There are few men with more blood on their hands than me, none that I know of. The Bloody Nine they call me, my enemies, and there's a lot of them. Always more enemies and fewer friends. Blood gets you nothing but more blood. It follows me now, always like my shadow. And like my shadow, I can never be free of it. I should never be free of it. I've earned it. I've deserved it. I've sought it out. Such is my punishment. Yeah, so Logan is kind of freaking us out right now. He's really self-aware, but also seems convinced he's trying to be a great guy now after helping Kwai. Either Crumby leaves some subtext there, almost to imply that Logan is being unconvincing. But some things have to be done. It's better to do them than to live with the fear of them. There are a couple of quotes and scenes in that chapter that we as readers finally get a glimpse into just how dark Logan's past really is. At this point, we've only seen things from his own limited and thoroughly skewed viewpoint. He admits he's done terrible things, but mostly blames them on either being young or circumstances beyond his control. Even his run-in with Calder doesn't produce much for the reader to go on beyond the fact that Calder is surprised to see him. Right now, all the reader gets to see is Nice Guy Logan, as Abercrombie wants us to see, especially compared to some of the characters we're about to meet from his past in a few chapters. The hints about Logan are there, even this early in the books, but it's all cleverly hidden and easily looked past by the readers. The other portion of the chapter that really made me consider Logan as a character is the confrontation with Bethod. Here we finally meet one of the characters that we assume will be one of the main antagonists for the trilogy, and his reaction to seeing Logan is disgust, and not to even acknowledge Logan as a human being. If that isn't direct evidence that our hero isn't quite what we've been led to believe, I don't know what is. Here's the guy rampaging across the north, committing atrocities and subduing everyone in sight, and he won't even speak to Logan as a man because of what he's done. 
So even with Logan's admissions in this chapter, how much of what he's saying is still skewed from his point of view. He owns up to being a pretty evil human being, but didn't he supposedly do all of those things at Bethar's behest? So what would lead Bethar to have that kind of reaction to encountering his one-time friend when they come face to face in this chapter? Food for thought, obviously. Right now, it seems like Logan is having a dialogue with himself. He's both simultaneously good and evil, and he's equally unsure which will take precedence at any given moment. A little later, in the weapons room, Bios goes on something of a rant about swords. He talks about their subtlety in relation to an axe or a mace. He argues that the sword has a voice. It very clearly calls to mind the title of the book and the quote that opens part one. The blade itself incites to deeds of violence. Chapter 14. A Road Between Two Dentists Glockta interrogates the man implicated in the murder of the Mercers through torture, seeking to uncover the mole within the Inquisition. This is the master maker Canadias. He turned and pointed to the dying man on the opposite wall. And this is the great Juvens, whom he has killed. I love getting my world building this way tossed into dialogue. The Juvens, Canadias, Bias, and the Magi are in the middle of a tangled web right now. The body of a man lay on the grass, bleeding from many wounds, with the forest behind him. Eleven other figures walked away, six on one side, five on the other, painted in profile, awkwardly posed, dressed in white, but their features indistinct. They faced another man, arms stretched out, all in black, and with a sea of colorfully daubed fire behind him. Glockter reveals that this is a scene depicting the death of Juvens. Juvens, who is Baez's master, doesn't Baez probably have to be in this mural? Which one is he? What role might he have played? This is a pretty boring chapter except for the continued comedy between Glockta and his practicals. We also get our first look at practical Sevard's House of Pain, which we'll see quite a bit more of in the trilogy. Outside of the minor history lesson, the mole, and a few chuckles, there really wasn't much worthy of discussion in this chapter. It almost feels like a palate cleanser after Logan's big reveal and what's going to be happening in the coming chapters. Chapter 15, Flatheads. The dogman contemplates life after Logan as the members of the gang reunite. Over Black Dow's objections, Three Trees assumes leadership and the group heads south, encountering a bad Ashanka along the way. No new characters here, but lots of existing ones fleshed out. Tulduru, Dogman, Three Trees, Black Dao, Harding Grim, and Forley the Weakest. He watched Black Dao rubbing a rag on the head of his axe, looking at the blade with eyes soft as a lover's. And a lot of men, most men even, wouldn't have dared meet no look like that from Black Dao. He got the name from having the blackest reputation in the north, with coming sudden in the black of night and leaving the villages behind him black from fire. That was the rumor, that was the fact. Two quotes, one purpose. Black Dao is a bad man. He's not the toughest guy on the block, maybe, but it definitely seems he's the most lacking in human decency. There's a lot of setup here for there not to be something in the cards for Dao. Abercrombie skillfully manipulates his characters with deliberate tactics, a fact that is particularly evident with Dogman. Abercrombie's point of view characters are universally despicable. We only root for them because everyone else around them is even worse. He also makes them underdogs by putting responsibilities on their shoulders that seem beyond their capability as human beings. In this chapter, Abercrombie charges Dogman and his gang with warning others of the Shanka incursions. They take responsibility for something that seems far too large for such a rampant band of thugs. All of that goes to show that Abercrombie isn't making us love his characters solely by making them interesting and vulnerable, but stacking the deck in their favor by twisting our perception of them. Nine fingers may be dead, said Three Trees in Dao's face, but your debt ain't. Why, he saw fit to spare a man as worthless as you, I'll never know, but he named me a second, and he tapped his big chest, and that means I'm the one with the say, me and no other. The most significant plot point here is definitely from the Three Trees quote. He references Black Dao's debt to Logan. In Logan's chapters, we've been given hints that he fought on Betho's behalf, but Three Trees is indicating that all the members of the gang were only allowed to live by Logan's grace. He beat them all and they owe their lives as a result. Dogman and Three Trees especially seem to respect that debt, while Black Dao thumbs his nose at it. The rest seem natural at best. Chapter 16, The Course of True Love, or the chapter in which Giselle finds out he isn't the center of the universe. Giselle shows up at practice to find Inquisitor Glockta waiting for him. Glockta mocks and goes Giselle, with no martial verus to train him. He wanders by Euro Sulfur, who insists Giselle cannot quit fencing. Seeking advice from Major Vest, he instead ends up spending more time with Artie, who convinces him to keep fencing. Glockta informs Giselle that he's there to chat. He asks simple questions, but demands complex answers. Why does Giselle fence? The answers are many, for country, for honor, for family. Glockta sweeps them all away. Recognizing himself in Giselle, he declares, Men don't fence for their kings or for their families or for the exercise either before you try that one on me. 
They fence for the recognition, for the glory. They fence for their own advancement. They fence for themselves. I should know. Next quote, and from a woman too, a woman and a bloody commoner, how dare she? He had wasted time on her and laughed at her jokes and found her attractive. She should have been honored to be noticed. Abercrombie has taken some criticism at times for being so male-heavy with his characters, but this passage makes me realize that the author is quite aware of fantasy's historical failings. He's actively pointing his finger at wrong-headed notions here, even if he isn't entirely practicing what he might be preaching by actually depicting women in a more equitable light. A lot of Giselle's chapters are going in this same kind of three-scene pattern. Fencing, random encounter, major plot mover. Each of those scenes and chapters have the same point, a ratcheting pressure for Captain Luthar to follow through on his commitment to winning the contest. There's a complete character arc in many ways within the chapter itself. Giselle begins in denial and ends up accepting the fact that the only reason he'll fence is to prove someone wrong. It's about pride and self-image. There's an honesty to it though, how many heroes in fantasy assume that role for glory hidden behind genuine sacrifice? I find it a much more realistic motivator, even more so than to meet a father's expectations or to impress a love interest. It's a motivation that resonates for real people in a much more meaningful, if uncomfortable way. Upcoming chapters feature something of a culmination of the novel's early story arcs for Glockta and Logan, which makes sense as it marks the end of part one of the blade itself. Like Giselle, Glockta and Logan are moving past the introductory stage as well. We know who they are and what they stand for, and it's time to put those characters to a test. Chapter 17. How Dogs Are Trained Glockta kidnaps a high-ranking mercer named Hornlach by bribing the sailors hired to smuggle him out of Adjua. After applying pressure in classic Glockta fashion, namely through threats of torture and psychological tomfoolery, Hornlach agrees to admit he defrauded the king. I do apologize for that, I know it's quite uncomfortable, but clothes can hide things, leave a man his clothes and you leave him pride, and dignity, and all kinds of things it's better not to have in here. Glockter really does his job well, doesn't he? Harlock caves in pretty fast after this line. This really feels like the first time Glockta tortures someone whose hands aren't entirely dirty. Harlock clearly knows something is going on, but seems genuinely uncomfortable admitting his culpability. Sept and Teufel, Salem Ruse and Carpi are all obviously involved. Glockta seems to have evidence to that effect. In the case of Hornlock, he just seems to be the highest ranking mercer he could get his hands on that Carpi knew, who was still breathing. As the chapter concludes, we learn that Glockta is training Hornlock to testify. One of the highlights of this chapter is that Practical Severard is really starting to be fleshed out. It started that he brokered the purchase of Glockta's safe house and continues here. Although Practical Frost is the big badass muscle dude, it's really Severard that's to be feared. In additional observations so far, Glockta seems to be living in an entirely different novel from the other characters, doesn't he? While reading this book, that's the impression I got. The contrast and quality from other chapters is quite noticeable. Chapter 18, Tea and Vengeance, aka the buddy road trip from hell. Bayaz, Logan, and Kwai head south and they get ambushed. Eventually, Logan is cornered and forced to give up his weapons. Only when Black Toad demands Bayaz follow suit does the Magus get involved and uses his magic to create fire to defeat enemies. In this chapter, there's a quote from Yuvan's Principles of Art. Base magic is wild and dangerous for it comes from the other side, and to draw from the world below is fraught with peril. The Magus tempers magic with knowledge and thus produces high art, but like the smith or the carpenter, he should only seek to change that which he understands. Logan, intrigued by the statement, assumes this means magi can do anything. There are rules, Bayaz remarks. The first law, that it's forbidden to speak with devils, is offered by Logan to the magi's surprise. Bayaz offers the second, it is forbidden to eat the flesh of man. There's so many awesome quotes here, it's got a lot of classic Logan voice in it, not to mention a pretty good primer for some of Abercrombie's commentaries. It ends with this quote, and I think it really says everything. Logan stared at the blade for a moment. It was clean, dull gray, just as it always had been. Unlike him, it showed not so much as a scratch from the hard use it had seen that day. He didn't want it back, not ever, but he took it anyway. There's a real resignation to those words. Logan cannot be anything but what he is. The world won't let him. And even if it would, would he let it? This chapter is long. So much happens in the conversation between Baez and Logan. Really, every time these two talk throughout the series, it's required to pay attention. Here's some of the things that were covered and a little something about it. Korib, Bethod's sorceress, has a power called the Long Eye. Basically, she can keep an eye on where Baez and Logan are going. Seems like an overly handy plot device. Kwai is a pretty crappy apprentice. His memory is bad, he lacks constitution. Why is he Baez's apprentice? It doesn't make any sense. 
Magi gain power through understanding nature. Why? How? We don't know. The second law, don't eat people. Seriously, I hope this will make sense later, but at this point in the story, it's just odd. Don't eat people. I loved you wizards get up to some strange stuff out of Logan on hearing the second law for the first time, because that's how I felt too. Logan doesn't like Bethod, but it's still not really clear why. It's almost like Logan just got tired of doing the things Bethod wanted him to do. If it's as simple as that, I continue to be unimpressed by his moral turpitude. However, we have this quote here. Logan thought of Bethod and his loathsome sons and the many good men they'd killed for their ambitions. The men he'd killed for their ambitions. The key phrasing there is the use of they and their. It isn't Bethod's ambition, it was their ambition that caused the hatred between the two of them. Seems something important to keep in mind going forward. This talking to spirits thing for Logan is overly emphasized. It better be important for later in the series. And finally, Bias blows some stuff up, but we learn that there's a cost he begins to shake after his fireball. We made it through part one. The first part was slow, but I wasn't bored in the least. It's a testament to Abercrombie's really interesting characters, because let's be honest, there's been an awful lot of walking around and standing in place so far. Next up, part two. A quote that begins part two. Life, the way it really is, is a battle not between good and bad, but between bad and worse. Joseph Brodsky. This quote definitely got my attention and planted some ideas in my head. With the opening of part two, we get a look at a completely new point of view character, and she is a she. Chapter 19. What freedom looks like. Pharaoh Maljin buries the last of her crew of escaped criminals and slaves when Yulve, an apparent magus, shows up to give her purpose. Pharaoh was bored with this. Let them come, and the eater too. She wouldn't die in a cage. She would cut her own throat if it came to that. She turned her back on him with a scowl and snatched up the shovel, started digging away furiously at the last grave. Soon, it was deep enough. This paragraph really captures Pharaoh well. She'd cut her throat to spite someone, but at the same time, she honors her dead companions even though she despises them. While there's a lot of good character building bits in there for Pharaoh, none of it really contributes to the plot. Abercrombie essentially needs to get Pharaoh up to speed, catching her up in development to his other major point of view characters in half the time. The result is a lengthy chapter that really forces Pharaoh to confront the scared, angry, and directionless person Gurkish cruelty has made her. The major item we're discussing in what freedom looks like is the use of the term eater. Given that it clearly refers to a magic practitioner and Juvens's second law states that eating flesh of men is forbidden, I think it's safe to say that Abercrombie just introduced a competing faction of magi. A few other interesting things. Yulve seems to do a lot of magic in this chapter. He avoids getting stabbed by Pharaoh a half dozen times. He then masks their travel through an armed encampment, yet he never seems to experience the kind of shakes Bias does after his firestorm in the previous Logan chapter. Is this a convenient plot device or something about magic we just don't understand? After vilifying the Gurkish early in the chapter through Pharaoh's bias and then through Yulwe's description of what they do to her, Abercrombie gives us another perspective at the chapter's end. Yulwe and Pharaoh observe a squad of soldiers talking about their fear of her and the families they've left back home. The takeaway is that Gurkish aren't much different. Chapter 20 The King's Justice Jazal observes the open council as Glockter presents evidence of the Mercer conspiracy to defraud the Union. The Mercers are dissolved as a result and their trade rights granted to the Inquisition for the foreseeable future. He saw Salt smirking across at High Justice Morovia. The old man's face was stony blank but his fists were clenched tight on the table before him. I include this quote because it's the first real indication we have that there's an ongoing battle among the Union elite. Most of the chapter is Giselle watching other characters do things, mostly Glockta. This is the fourth or fifth chapter where it's told from the point of view of a completely passive observer, all involving the closed or open councils. Of course, Abercrombie never gives us the point of view of someone actually on these governing bodies, so this is really the only tool left to him. Interestingly, he never shows the evidence presented by Sultan Glockta in the closed council regarding the Mercer's guilt. It means we have no idea what kind of documented evidence the Inquisition possesses confirming the testimony by the tortured merchants. All we know is what Giselle observes. Two things stood out to be of significance. Lord Brock has much to lose by the Mercer's being dissolved. He also seems genuinely shocked at the cavalier nature members of the closed council seem to be treating torture. High Justice Morovia is neutered to opposing the Inquisition, but he does not like the taste his impotence leaves in his mouth. What's unclear is whether that's out of some sense of right and wrong, or whether he's just mad that Salt got one up on him in the proverbial Game of Thrones. 
The discovery that the Mercer's income will now be directed to the Inquisition finally clarifies Salt's underlying motive. He wanted to funnel funds through the Inquisition and by proxy through his hands. We can take into account the growing pile of bodies at his feet as well, and it has to make the reader shake their heads in disgust that all we've seen Locke to do in the name of the king's justice was merely to this end. I think we are a very long way from seeing why Salt is doing all of this, but even in the early going, almost everyone can agree that despicable is a pretty light term for what Salt has done. So, how guilty is Glockta by association? He's been Salt's direct hand in all of this. He knows on some level exactly why Salt is doing what he's doing. He admits as much but did it anyway. Granted, Glockta's motivations are completely different, but he's the engine moving the proverbial train here in Adjua. Chapter 21 Means of Escape Lieutenant John Horm and Inquisitor Glockta serve the Mercer's Guild with notice of their treasons as ruled by the Council. Glockta finds Magister Colt with a noose around his neck and a determination to die rather than be questioned. Before he takes a leap into the abyss, Colt admits to his treason against the King but implicates other culprits, the banks, the university, the close council, and Glockta's own house of questions. The ravings of a man with nothing to lose or the true utterances of the condemned. Glockta wonders. Cheap clothes and expensive windows. If the cloth had been stronger, we would have got him. If the window had more lead, we would have got him. Lives hinge on such chances. One of Amber Crombie's classic little lines that observe the vagaries of life and the tiny details that make a difference between success and failure. Another quick-hitting Glockta chapter reveals little new except for introducing a new player into the political landscape, the back of Valint and Balk. They are the hand behind much of the corruption and the abuse in union government. Probably. In these revelations, some of Abercrombie's other themes are starting to come to light. Although the meat of the series is about subverting epic fantasy, there's also some very real commentary on more traditional literary themes. Abercrombie offers some insight into the nature of wealth and our obsession with it. Colt's illusion of wealth, gilded crown molding and ornate clothing, is dispelled when he dies. Glockta realizes it was all a show and that the Mercers were perhaps no better off than anyone else. It's very easy to draw some conclusions about what the author might be saying about our own hierarchies of wealth and privilege. Chapter 22 Three Signs Major West finishes a practice session with an improving Captain Luthar and informs him that he better distance himself from his sister. West then visits Lord Marshal Burr, learning of incursions by the Northmen into Union territory. He is appointed to the Marshal's personal staff over his objections due to the lack of blue pigment in his blood. West realized he was squeezing Giselle's arm with all his strength. How had that happened? He only meant to have a quiet word and now he'd gone way too far. You'll remember that Major Vest got a little angry with Artie earlier. He is another example of his temper when it comes to family matters. He can't stop himself from physically threatening Giselle if he doesn't stay away from his sister. This war was a bad thing, a terrible thing no doubt. He felt himself grinning. A terrible thing, but it just might be the making of him. Yep, this is the same Major Vest whose debut chapter was titled The Good Man. With an opportunity to rise, something West assumed was denied to him as common born, is it possible he'll find himself more closely associated with Giselle's than Luther's rampant egoism? We will find out. West needs to protect his sister and continue to excel at the only thing that allowed him to elevate his family, soldiering. While doing all this, we learn that the Union's military power is only skin deep. Still recovering from the war with the Gurkish, the Close Council has decided to send every troop they have to fight in the north, hoping to overwhelm Bethod and end the war before the Gurkish can react. Given what we know about how fiction works, I feel safe assuming that that won't work, and that the only question worth answering is, how catastrophically bad is this going to bite them in the behind? When we last saw White Eye, Hensel, and the Feared back in An Offer and a Gift, they rather ominously delivered the message when it is time we will send three signs, which sounded almost suspiciously like prophecy, something you wouldn't expect from Abercrombie, and I should have trusted my instincts. The three severed heads of the commanders of England Frontiers post is much more in keeping with what to expect from the first law in terms of signs and importance. Obviously, turning tropes on their, in this case, literally severed heads, is a theme in the first law world in general, and Amber Crombie is a master of that. Burr is actually really capable. He is the first person in the Union so far who seems to have his head on straight. There's a real recognition by him that the core of Adjua is rotten, and they're in desperate need of people like Colin West to get them through. Burr also observes that the Inquisition's destruction of the Mercers has eroded the support of many powerful nobles to the degree that they're dragging their feet and raising levies for the war effort. This begs the question, did the Inquisition foresee this, and was it part of their plan? Long story short, the Union is in a bad situation, which only becomes more clear in Chapter 23, The Theatrical Outfitters. 
Logan, Baez, and Malika's Squire arrive in Edgewa, leaving Logan stunned by its size. He's equally stunned by the poor quality of soldiers he sees preparing to march on Bethod. Baez takes them to a costume shop to acquire appropriate garb for their visit to the power halls of the Union. The purpose of the chapter is really to give Adjua, the city, and Union at large some more color. It's pretty basic. The poor are mistreated, it's crowded, and it stinks. The rich are really rich, and the poor are really poor, and no one seems to care. The great wage secret wars for power and wealth, and they call it government. Wars of words, the tricks and guile, but no less bloody for that. This is a quote from Baez, something I find very ironic as he considers reclaiming his place in the power structures of Adjua as well. There's an idea in this chapter that appearances are everything. Give the people what they want. In this case, the fine people of Adjua have exactly the same expectations that we do as readers. Proper wizards should be garbed in absurdly appointed finery and savage Northmen ought to have loincloths. Compare this to the last chapter where Glockta watches Magister Colt plummet to his death as a result of cheap clothing and the extended metaphor for the western world starts to emerge. Spelling it out perhaps, we're a little too concerned with style over substance. The chapter ends with a bit of comedy as we imagine Logan dressing apart for the benefit of the Adria elite. Abercrombie via Baez winks at the reader as if saying, all those other fantasies are play acting too, I'm here to give you the real deal. It's about the closest an author comes to speaking directly to his readers in the book. Before I move on to the next chapter, I have to say, as the narrative transitioned into part two, my expectations were set for an escalation in intensity and depth. However, the progression through the chapters in part 2 so far proved to be somewhat tedious. This is evident in the brevity of my summaries, the scarcity of memorable quotes, and a noticeable dip in the writing quality. Additionally, the character development which had been a strong suit earlier seems to have taken a backseat, leading to a plot that unfolds in a rather elementary fashion. While the earlier focus on character work was commendable, it appears to have come at a cost, resulting in a plot that despite its slow evolution, lacks the satisfaction and entertainment value one might anticipate after reading part one. Still, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that things will pick up and get back on track soon. Chapter 24, Barbarians at the Gate. Giselle fantasizes about Artie as he runs the morning practice. On arrival, he's informed he and Major West will duel before an audience. Giselle trounces West, receives some congratulations, and heads off to his duty station where he encounters Baez and Logan. He escorts the pair to their meeting with Chamberlain Hoff. He sees Arch Lector Solt and High Justice Marovia within the meeting before he's dismissed. A magnificent old man was striding purposefully across the bridge, bald head held high, a fabulous gown of shimmering red and silver flowing about him in the breeze. So Giselle is apparently the kind of person that Baez mocks at the costume shop. Can we really be surprised? This is a description of Logan Ninefingers. Never in his life had Giselle seen a more brutish looking man. Even Fenris the Feared had seemed civilized by comparison. His face was like a whipped back, crisscrossed with ragged scars. His nose was bent, pointing off a little sideways. One ear had a big notch out of it. One eye seemed touch higher than the other, surrounded by a crescent-shaped wound. His whole face, in fact, was slightly beaten, broken, lopsided, like that of a prize fighter who had fought a few bouts too many. His expression, too, was that of one punch drunk. He gawped up at the gatehouse, forehead furrowed, mouth hanging open, staring about him with a near animal stupidity. Good lord. The significant bits in the Barbarians at the Gate are twofold. Giselle has turned a corner as a fencer. He defeats Major West, an accomplished fencer and champion in his own right with mocking ease. This is the first time we've really shown a Giselle that's capable and confident. And second, there's a recognition that Baez is somewhat important, but there's a natural denial that he is the Baez of legend. I've ruminated several times while reading whether the Baez we've been following is the same Baez and Scondon in a statue on the Kingsway. Abercrombie is now forcibly connecting these dots to ask the same question. In this chapter, we have Logan and Baez making their official entrance and the beginning of their interactions with the rest of the cast of the novel. I have hopes that there are some good times forthcoming. Chapter 25, next. Archlector Solt exults in his victory over the Mercers while chiding Lochta for his sloppy investigation of Superior Kalein's involvement. Superior Goyle, who was mentioned in Chapter 1, from England, is being reassigned to take Kalein's place in Adjua. Glockta argues that Goyle has a hack. Solt disagrees, and the two go on to discuss Valent and Balk. Glockta wants to investigate the bank, but Solt rejects the idea, claiming them too well connected. Solt assigns Glockta to investigate Baez, who must be a fraud despite possessing the appropriate paperwork to assume the traditional seat on the closed council reserved for the first of the Magi. I take no pleasure in it. I take no pleasure in anything. Thank you for that, our unreliable narrator, Sandang Lokta. We definitely do not believe you. There's an empty seat on the closed council. There always has been. A pointless tradition, matter of etiquette, a chair reserved for a mythical figure, in any case dead for hundreds of years. 
Nobody ever supposed that anyone would come forward to claim it. Lots of world building in this little sentence. It shows that Bayaz, if he is truly the first of the Magi, is hundreds of years old. He's a mythical figure. His showing up to claim a chair on the closed council gives us a reason for why he's dragged Logan south, sort of. The question becomes what is Bayaz trying to accomplish, particularly given that we know he helped Bethod get to where he is today. This is a short chapter, but Abercrombie packs a lot into it. Handing off the Mercer investigation to Superior Goyle, Glockte has a new task, investigating Bias. Abercrombie seems to be discarding the Valentin Balk plotline here, but let's remember the bankers as it comes back with a vengeance later. In the meantime, Salt seems to believe that Bias is a fraud at best and a spy for the Gurkish at worst. Or perhaps more as a proxy for the nobility who remain rather worried because of the Mercer downfall. Abercrombie is writing almost episodic arcs for Glockte thus far. Where is it going? How will it tie together? I'm not sure any of it would work if Glockta wasn't such an incredibly compelling character, because as it stands now, his arc is rather disjointed. Chapter 26 Better Than Death Yilwei reveals to Pharaoh that he's taking her to Adjua. He rejects the notion but follows him anyway. They come across a band of slavers that offers to sell a young girl to Pharaoh. She gets mad. These pinks, they don't like us, like real people. We have no business with their kind. I'd rather stay among the Gurkish, besides, I have scores to sell here. Interesting to see this stereotypical barbarian style character refer to the pale skinned people as less than human. It's a small thing, but not an insignificant one in a series challenging some of the expectations we have about what epic fantasy is supposed to look like or how it usually looks like. Killing him could have filled that empty space, if only for a while. That was how it worked. Just another horrifying look into what makes Pharaoh thick. It's a line that sounds sociopathic, but actually humanizes her to an extent. She feels a need to fill up a void inside her. Isn't that a hint that there's something in there that can be put back together? This chapter mostly continues to emphasize the hollowed out nature of Pharaoh's emotional state. It is also full of plot nuggets and world building hints. It's really interesting seeing how an author structures his foreshadowing and layering of information to create a sense of reality to his imaginings. It's something a lot of authors aren't good at, resulting in things being dropped into the story that seem to come from nowhere or never spending the time to invest in a character and their situation. Not so with this book. Abercrombie understands storytelling and it's no more evident than it is in this and the next chapter. Abercrombie uses small, almost throwaway scenes or in some cases small paragraphs to give us a hint at the things to come or flesh out his world in a way that makes sense within the narrative. Here we have two of those moments. One, the Gosca is going to be ground zero for the conflict between the Gurkish and the Union. The ships are being built for a purpose and this little scene which Yulwe lends import gets us thinking about what's to come. You may recall in an offer and a gift, the, the Gosk representatives lobby the crown for more resources to shore up the walls. Abercrombie is layering us with tidbits about the situation south of Adjua so that when the powder keg explodes, it's really something we're not only expecting but believe in wholeheartedly. Second, we learn more about the Gurkish emperor, Uthman. We know that he condones slavery, as indicated by Pharaoh's troubles, but it's confirmed in Better Than That that he's also hell-bent on scouring the Union from the Gosca. War is inevitable. We're also shown what that slavery really means here. In this chapter, Pharaoh is offered a girl from the slave train for coin. The woman is debased and ashamed and Pharaoh can do nothing to stop it. Even killing the tormentor lacks purpose because the kind of behavior on display is so pervasive throughout the empire. It is frightening and designed to make us like the Union, despite the fact that their society is nearly as unequal and problematic. Chapter 27 Sore Thumb Logan leaves the silk cell the closed council has put him in to walk through Adjua. He's awed by its size and foreign nature. He returns to his room to sleep, but wakes when a ghostly apparition of his long dead wife appears. Reality is warped and the room explodes, leaving a gaping hole in the ceiling. Baez believes it is an eater's work, sent by Kalul. Logan asks what an eater is. The question goes unanswered as Baez falls into an exhausted sleep until Malachus enters. It's forbidden, he whispers, to eat the flesh of men. I gave them this, his bias. Logan felt the unpleasant, creeping sensation that always seemed to accompany the old wizard's displeasure. I gave them freedom, and this is the thanks I get, the scorn of clerks, of swollen-headed old errand boys. Temper. Bias gives us something of a major rest moment here. He seemed always in control thus far. He's slipping merely a moment of frustration or something of his true nature shining through a false veneer of cordiality. No plants clung to that looming mass, not even a clump of moss in the cracks between the great blocks. The house of the maker, Bias had called it, it looked like no house that Logan had ever seen. There were no roofs above, no doors or windows in those naked walls, a cluster of mighty, sharp-edged tiers of rock. What need could there ever be to build a thing so big? Who was this maker anyway? Was this all he made? A great, big, useless house?
Logan is asking the same questions we're asking. What the hell is all this mythology that Abercrombie is hinting at? I think it's due time to get more information. Following the model from the previous chapter, there's a similar kind of setup going on in Sore Thumb. We're starting to get real confirmation that Bias isn't just an insane person who thinks he's the original Bias. This makes him quite ancient and perhaps infinitely more powerful than he's appeared to this point. Although he has flexed his magical muscle, he hasn't done anything that's on par with the wizards of epic fantasy. As the chapter concludes, we get a hint that perhaps he drove off the attack. Physical exhaustion was a problem after his fire summoning on the road to Adjua and here he just passed out. Before doing so, he mentions someone named Kalul and Eaters. We've heard the term Eater before, but Malakas connects the dots explicitly in the last line of the chapter. It is forbidden to eat the flesh of men in one of Yuvens' laws of magic, and it seems the Eaters break it. Who is Kalul though, and who does he work for? We know Eaters are after Pharaoh, logic would then dictate Kalul is in cahoots with Uthman. Two other quick notes. First, the girl Logan meets on the bench is quite clearly arty, and it's fascinating how she interacts with Logan. She's depressed and self-destructive, yet it's easy to empathize with her. In fact, she's by far the most empathetic or maybe even the only empathetic character in the book. Artie's reaction to Logan after seeing pretty much the rest of the population of Adria being horrifically repulsed by Logan stood out and made me like her quite a bit more. She appears to be a victim of a system that oppresses both the lower classes and women, placing R.D. West in a particularly disadvantaged position. Second, Logan's observations of the unit of Union soldiers is a fun bit of foreshadowing. It's a little too overt in the grand scheme of things, but Abercrombie is laying the groundwork for how the Union will continue to screw things up. Even a well-trained unit designed for battle on Union terms is going to fail in the North, where nothing goes as planned as the land is as much your enemy as the men trying to kill you. Chapter 28. Questions. Severard informs Glockta that there's been a disturbance with Bias and his companions. Glockta investigates, but disbelieves Logan's account and Bias's power. They part ways with the Inquisitor even more convinced that Bias is a fraud. This is a chapter where we see our favorite misshapen torturer in the same room with Logan and Bias, which is just about as entertaining as it sounds. Only one chair, half a table, and a tall ornamental jar, strangely pristine in the middle of the rubble-strewn floor, had escaped destruction. Another great example of the trick Abercrombie uses to give his reader a sense of connectivity, Logan saved the vase in the previous chapters during his nocturnal encounter to great comedic effect. Now the vase is still there, serving a purpose. It makes the canvas Abercrombie paints on feel alive. It's a great and simple technique. I touched on this previously as well, but many of Abercrombie's characters possess blinders, both to themselves and the people around them. They are, like most of us, incapable of seeing outside of their own experiences. Glockta is the opposite. Painfully aware of his own shortcomings, he's incredibly savvy about the people around him. Where Jazal assumes he knows about the men he plays cards with, Glockta makes few assumptions until given evidence to work with. He is in many ways Abercrombie's truth teller, the character closest to the author's own voice that he can use to illuminate what's really going on without impeaching his tight point of view. Glockta demonstrates this well in questions when chatting with Logan. Not a brute, Glockta recognizes him for a thoughtful man who is deliberate in his speech and dangerous for it. Where others have been taken in by the garish garb of the trio of visitors purchased at the shop, Glockta sees pretenders and actors trying to be something they're not. Putting aside for a moment that they actually are what they're pretending to be, Glockta is quick to recognize they're play-acting something. He just misses that they're just pretending to be what everyone expects the Magi to look like rather than being the actual legendary figures out of history. This is directly juxtaposed by Giselle who is taken aback by Baez's fine wizarding garb some chapters back. It's not like Glockta doesn't have his own foibles. In questions, he's too cynical, ignoring the signs that Baez might be who he claims, insisting on his own interpretation of the events, he also willfully ignores Archlector Solt's rather clear order to stay away from Valentin Balk, but he does these things with the rationale behind him, not tainted by bias. He's also by far the character with the most empathy, able to put himself in another's shoes and understand where they're coming from. It's an odd descriptor to put on a torturer, but it fits rather nicely into the paradigm of shifting expectations that Abercrombie creates. Overall, questions kick off a few new angles and dribbles out some information. Glockta isn't satisfied with Archlector Sol's decision about the Mercers. I'm pretty sure this isn't going to end well for anyone. Logan speaks the spirit, which we knew, but the spirits in Adjur are gone, sleeping. Interesting. Why? Baez uses his power to try to overcome Glockta's skepticism, but the Inquisitor resists. Does he really resist, or is Baez toying with him, or did Baez really use power at all? Chapter 29, Nobility. 
Giselle fights his opening duel in the contest, which he wins in spite of his nerves. Afterward, he has a rendezvous with R.D. West, knowing full well it's a terrible idea. They kiss. A standout quote from this chapter, a few glasses of wine can be the difference between finding a man a hilarious companion or an insufferable moron. So in this chapter, we finally get to see the contest and what it's all about. Four rounds, single elimination, with Giselle noting he has to defeat four men to win means there are 16 fighters in total. On the first day, there are only two matches, Giselle's and another. The contest then is spread over some days. I find it a bit odd logistically to hold a tournament that has such short matches over such a large time frame. As a side note, Giselle defeats his first opponent, Broya, so casually as to make us wonder whether the contest is full of terrible nobles with overly high opinions of their skills or if Giselle is really this great. Knowing that he had great mentors, Giselle could legitimately be very good, but there's at least a chance that most of the contest is populated by rubbish fencers and careless nobles. Beyond the contest, the only other interesting tidbits are West's musing about what the war in England might look like and putting a deadline as to when it will happen. Although the Union as a whole feels overwhelming confidence, I'm taking West and Logan at their word that a fight between the Union and the North will be trouble. In terms of Artie, I think the chapter title Nobility pretty well seals the fact that she has an agenda. She's trying to manipulate Giselle intentionally, not as merely a distraction for her boredom. Is it to make her brother angry, to approve her station, or is she merely toying with a noble because she can? I'm not a huge fan of the man-eater trope, but Abercrombie executes it pretty well with Artie West. Chapter 30, Dark Work. Dogman finds a burning house where an old man, his daughter, and her two children have been hanged. The entire group, Black Dow included, find this pretty reprehensible, relatively speaking. They pursue the murderers and take care of them. They learn that Bethod is taking the countryside and raising those who can't pay. It also comes to light that Bethod is warring with the Union. The North is undefended should the Shanka come south. Forley the Weakest proposes a plan to warn Bethod of the Shanka threat. Although everyone agrees it's a bad idea, it's the best they have. Black Dow has a black reputation, it appears to be well deserved. It's for work like this that you bring along a man like me. This whole chapter is pretty much one long character study of the various members of Logan's crew. They don't have much of a story to tell for themselves yet, they're checking things out, not really sure if it's for them, but don't mind spending some time to find out. Chapter 31 Words and Dust Glockta watches Bremen Don Gorst and Ilie, the crowd favorite, Kirster, in the contest, then he goes to the university located in a neglected corner of the Agriant to dig up dirt on Bias. He discovers ancient histories that indicate the true Bias would have a key to the house of the maker. Who's going to look after the past when I'm gone? Who cares? Asks Glockta as he's talked towards the steps, as long as it isn't me. This quote is so good, such a wonderful finish to this chapter. The loss of history, of context, is at root of the Union's rotten core. It plays a little on the tired axiom, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it, but does so without being trite. Glockta recognizes history is important, just not important enough for anyone like him to pay attention to. Otherwise, in this chapter, we learn about the historical accounting of Bayaz and the other Asians. Here's what we learned. Bayaz is actually the first letter in the alphabet of the old tongue. Juvens gave Bayaz his name, one letter, one name, first apprentice, first letter of the alphabet, etc. Before the union, there was a dude named Herod, who became Herod the Great. Bayaz promised to make him king if he did as he was told. Herod was skeptical, but he came around. Bayaz made Herod establish the capital in Adua, make peace with certain neighbors, and war with some others. Eventually, the union was formed and Bayaz became the chief counselor, and all the structures of the union that survived sprung from the Magus. When Herod died, Bayaz left with a promise to come back. Before Herod, chaos ensued after Ewens and his brother Canadias, the master maker, went to war. It seems Canadias killed Ewens and his apprentices sought vengeance. Canadias took refuge in the house of the Maker, which the Magi threw their power against for 12 days and nights. Then Bias found a way inside, killed Canadias, but they couldn't find something called the Seed. The Magi sealed up the house of the Maker, buried the dead along with Canadias and his daughter, and Bias took the key. Now that's an info dub. This is a primer on which a great deal of conjecture and supposition will be based as we move through the series. Chapter 32, The Remarkable Talents of Brother Longfoot Logan wakes up to find Brother Longfoot, a renowned navigator, in their apartment. A bit of a talker, Longfoot regales the Northmen with his worldly experience. Bias tells them to prepare for a journey to the Old Empire, but not before the last party member arrives. He sends the pair to the docks, laden with gold, to find a ship that will carry them. This quote stands out in this chapter. Now, commoners can be rich, you see, and a rich commoner has power. Is he a commoner now, or a nobleman? Or is he something else? Very complicated all of a sudden, no? This is much plainer than some of the conflicts Arch Lecter Solt has been dancing around. Who holds the power in Adria remains a mystery. 
Despite being one of the self-acclaimed best navigators out there, Brother Longfoot is somewhat fairly innocent as a character, not realizing what sort of danger he gets in by showing off his wealth, although he talks about the haves and have-nots shortly before that. I'm not sure this chapter serves any great purpose other than providing some texture to the world that Logan, Baez, and the rest will soon explore. We learn that Baez wishes to go to the Old Empire, a place we know nothing about, to discover something yet unrevealed. We also see Logan looking for some companionship, albeit of the paying for it variety. Much like Pharaoh and Giselle and Glockta and well everyone, Logan has a void in himself he's trying to fill. He's a monster who wants to be something else and he seems to seek out the kinds of comforts others do but only seem to be trying to convince himself of their efficacy. Chapter 33 Her Kind Fight Everything Pharaoh and Yulwe watch Dagoska at night. Unsure whether his art can keep them hidden in such a populous place, Yulwe goes in alone. Pharaoh takes the chance to flee. She is found by two eaters who nearly capture her. Yulwe rescues her and easily dispatches the pair. Most important quote in this chapter is The word of Eos governs all. There can be no exceptions. My first response was Who in God's name is Eos? This is the first mention of the name and only one of three mentions in the entire first novel. Yulve invokes him in reference to the second law, which prohibits eating human flesh. I thought these were Yuvens's laws. Moments like these demonstrate the tricky parts of history. Attributions are fuzzy at best and change over time. History and the interpretation of it is an absolute key theme in the series. Also of interest is Yulve's familiarity with Kalul. He seems to hint that Kalul was once a colleague and remains something more than a mere adversary. Yulve dispatches his disciples, the eaters, with such ease that I would venture a guess that Yulve is one of the originals, as well as not some mere apprentice to Bias. He certainly seems to be more adept at using his magic without getting the head pain that Bias seems to get. Although the chapter continues to emphasize Pharaoh as something of an unwilling participant in Yulwe's schemes, the chapter provides little insight in that regard. Abercrombie continues to be the drum of her emotional disconnects, her lack of direction and her inability to separate herself from the Magi. Given the direction of their travel and Baez's comments with regards to the rest of the travel party, I suspect Pharaoh will be linking up with Logan and crew in Adria very soon. Chapter 34 She Loves Me Not Challenged for the first time in the contest, Giselle narrowly defeats the Westport champion Filio, three touches to two. After drinking and gambling with his officers, he reacts aggressively when the topic turns to Artie's West proclivities for romantic liaisons. Taking his leave, Giselle rests against the wall outside to gather himself. He realizes not only does he have more of a temper than he ever imagined, but he's in love with Artie West. And worse, she doesn't love him. Hell, she doesn't even like him. Beautiful from a distance, no doubt, but he imagined that her face would feel like glass to the touch, cold, hard and brittle. Written in reference to Therese, Princess of Talents, there's hints that this isn't the last time Therese will be mentioned. Giselle's chapters have been having this shape to them of late, fencing, carousing, self-loathing, typically in that order. Unfortunately, the fencing has been largely uninteresting. Even here, Abercrombie glosses over the final bits of the action in favor of a card game, only providing the results of the match in the subsequent dialogue. Giselle's realization at the chapter's end rocks the very foundations of his character. For the first time ever, he's not an object of desire but of convenience. He believes Artie is using him to elevate her own position irrespective of his looks or charm. As we start to approach the end of the blade itself, well, sort of, I'm starting to notice an increased pace in the chapters. They feel shorter and possess a deeper bite than their earlier counterparts. Where all three of our primary characters were given some measure of success or stability, Abercrombie is now removing it and sending them scrambling. Logan is wrestling with violence again, having to defend brother Longfoot in the streets. Giselle's success in the contest is easily forgotten as he tortures himself over Artie West. And Glockta, despite destroying the Mercers, is being undermined by his own organization. Chapter 35 The Seed Glockta wakes up, unsure of his surroundings, first his mother, then Arch Lector Salt, and then a woman's voice he does not recognize, all the men to know about the seed. The figure, claiming not to be a woman at all, knows all about the fall of the maker. She demands the seed, but Glockta cannot give it. Later, Glockta meets Severard over a mauled body. They discuss Valentin Balk, but get nowhere beyond the fact that they're not to be messed with. Unsure of the body's origin, they bring it to the university where the Adeptus Physical, Candelau, decrees the cause of death to be human bites. At least partially eaten, the body is mauled beyond hope of identifying the victim. Before Glockta can reason an explanation, Superior Goyle and his three practicals arrive. Immediately, they throw their weight around like petulant children, the corpse is disposed of, and the cause of death listed as dog bites. This is set in reference to Gorst. Well, I say he's a genius, said Glockta. In a couple of years, they'll all be fencing like him. If you can call it fencing, you mark my words. 
Giselle is the old world, a wealthy noble trained in the fine art of fencing with its beautiful form and thrusts. Gorst is the opposite. Ill-mannered and brutish, he's efficient and ruthless, he's the logical next step in the evolution of hand-to-hand -hand combat. A person, unidentified, perhaps a man, perhaps a woman, either young or old, was attacked in the park by an unknown assailant bitten to death within 200 steps of the king's palace and partially eaten? Black humor did only worse than Glockta's voice. I really would have loved to have seen him continue this line of attack, but Goyle showed up. Let's get the obvious out of the way. Glockta's visitor is almost certainly the same visitor who paid Logan a visit several chapters ago. Given the knowledge she displays in this chapter regarding the seed and the happenings of the night Canadias died, it seems likely to me we're talking about the Master Maker's daughter. At least that is my theory. She's as of this moment unnamed. The morning after the woman's appearance, Glockta and Severard find a body that's been partially eaten. Our mystery woman displays three abilities, coming and going as she pleases, temperature control, and shapeshifting. Is it a coincidence that magic is used in Glockta's rooms and an eaten body is found nearby, or is Canadias' daughter an eater? As this chapter concludes, Goyle says to Glockta, we don't need you anymore. On the heels of bullying the Adeptus physical into agreeing dogs were the cause of death, it makes Goyle seem decidedly juvenile. His goals do not seem to be anything but making life more difficult for Glockta. In fact, this seems generally to be the goal of the entire Inquisition post-Mercer conspiracy. I can't help but wonder if Abercrombie needed to park Glockta for a bit while the Bias storyline played out and ended up with a convenient tool for some world-building info dumping. The next chapter has implications for this novel and the ones immediately following. You know what they say, never bet against the Magus. In this chapter, Giselle gets his butt kicked. Glockta relishes it, Bias cheats, and Giselle is a sore winner. Although Logan has talked about his past deeds before, this is the first time we get some honest reflection into what Logan did as the Bloody Nine. Cutting and cutting and licking the blood from his fingers while the dogman stared in horror and Beth laughed and cheered him on. He didn't just kill in a professional manner, he maimed and slaughtered and bathed in blood, he relished it. It's a much different picture than the Logan we spent time with in this first novel. Then, when the end seemed certain, out of the corner of his eye, Logan saw the air above Baez's shoulder shimmer, as it had on the road south when the trees burned, and he felt that strange tugging at his guts. Is Logan the only one who can feel Baez's magic being cast? Does it have something to do with attunement to the spirits? Could Logan have been a magus with training? Does Logan do magus things subconsciously? Lots of unanswered questions at this point. This is the first chapter in which Abercrombie changes points of views. We get Giselle, Glockta, and Logan points of view, all watching the same events from a different angle and worldview. Why does he do this? I have absolutely no idea, but there might be a few reasons. This chapter is all about setting up Gorst's character for Abercrombie's fifth novel, The Heroes. Logan and Glockta think he's something special. Giselle hates him for what he represents, and Gorst embraces Giselle for beating him. If the story is only from Giselle's point of view, we wouldn't know why he was capable of victory. If it was a Logan chapter, we wouldn't get any reaction from Giselle in his moment of victory, thus robbing us of his smugness. If it was a Glockta chapter, it would just be an absurd amount of internal monologue, no matter how great that might sound. Abercrombie needed Glockta to see Baez working hard at some unseen purpose. It's evidence he'll need to connect the dots. It's an interesting departure stylistically. Personally, I found it a little jarring. Logan and Glockta function merely as observers in this chapter, with Baez as the primary actor. Although Giselle is fighting, he's entirely passive, absorbing blow after blow from Gorst until Baez boosts his stamina, strength, and his ego. To what end is Baez manipulating the outcome? He's had limited interactions with Giselle and no discussion about what his plans are beyond traveling to the old empire. It clearly reveals a longer game, one that requires a nobleman of some standing to execute. His plans obviously have an impact on the very nature of the monarchy, which is foreshadowed heavily by the king's interaction with Giselle at the chapter's end. What seems a misunderstanding of identity is a definite clue from Abercrombie as to what Baez's plans for a fencing nobleman may be. Equally important is Glockta's reaction to Baez's perceived effort as Giselle is winning. Is this the start of Glockta buying into Baez as first of the Magi returning? It would seem a leap of logic for Glockta to go from total skeptic to open-minded doubter, but clearly his knowledge of the physical world is shaken by what he witnesses. Giselle does things in the match that are simply not possible, particularly to one of Glockta's training. Chapter 37. The Ideal Audience 
Glockta is interviewed by the Arch Lecter as to the progress of his investigation. Despite a poor performance, Glockta reveals that only the real Bias could produce a key to the house of the maker. The pair agree to pose Bias with a challenge at Giselle's celebration banquet. Bias indicates he has a key and declares he'll enter the house of the maker tomorrow. I heard a song once in England about a nine-fingered man. What was he called now? The Bloody Nine, that was it. Logan felt his grin slipping. One of those Norton songs, you know the kind, all violence, he cuts off heads by the cartload, this bloody nine, and burned towns and mixed blood with his beer and whatnot. That wasn't you, was it? We've not seen the bloody nine in action yet, but manufacturers like this don't make us eager. All these hints scattered throughout the book, yet everyone seems content just sitting around. It really makes me wonder if we'll ever actually see Logan in action in this book. So what's going on in this chapter? Too much, probably. Once again, we get a split point of view chapter. While the narrative of the chapter describes the culmination of the Inquisition's unsuccessful attempts to discredit Baez, its purpose is really about increasing the tension for all of the other storylines. Logan describes what West will be up against in the North, we get some more tidbits about Logan's past, Giselle gets what he's always wanted but still something is missing, Glockta finds himself very much on thin ice at the Inquisition, something that will surely only be exacerbated by his failure to indict Baez. Bias demonstrates he is what he says he is and indicates a far more robust history with the Union than we ever suspected. Solt's character is really annoying. Why would you order an investigator to investigate someone and then refuse to listen to what he had to say? And if you're looking for a way to draw away Bias, wouldn't a brutal murder right outside his window be the perfect opportunity to take him down under question? Or at least his violent looking northern companion? Salt's dripping with so much contempt, it's backfiring, making him seem less like a big shot villain and more like a petty snake. On the other hand, his impatience and apparent short-sightedness make him more of a danger to Glockta. Were he really the smart, savvy player, Glockta and he would be too closely aligned, so some of his traits seem forced as well. The entire purpose of this chapter is layering of expectations and history that weaves into the actual narrative. On the whole, we're left with little to speculate about. There were several interesting items. Giselle recalls that Morley the Mad and King Casimir had some odd personality quirks. Interestingly, both of those rulers were influenced by Baia's direct involvement as he describes later in the chapter. What impact may he have had on them remains a question. Baez says Canadias never worked in gold because he did not care for beautiful things, only things that worked. This seems like foreshadowing. In describing the tanner, the death of a king's collector and High Justice Morovia's response to it, I can't help but wonder if there's some motivating force behind the unrest. Is the empire trying to sow seeds of distrust or perhaps the weak king is about to be ousted from within? Is this a result of the Inquisition's power grab? We don't know. We'd get more intimations that some folks would be happy and Adria might be better off in Pris Ladisla bit the dust. Chapter 38 The House of the Maker Bias takes Logan, Jazal, and Glockta into the house of the Maker. It's pretty creepy. Bias regales them with the tales of the past, they come up with a really heavy black box, the contents of which remain a mystery. Abercrombie, in the middle of what should be one of the tensest scenes in the blade itself, makes an absolutely obvious Lord of the Rings joke. It works in a large part because of the audience and the scene, but the constant subversion of expectations while initially intriguing is starting to wear a bit thin for me. It's almost as if the book is trying too hard in that aspect. Another quote, the only thing he could imagine worse than his present company was no company at all. Abercrombie makes something or someone feel good because the alternative feels so bad. In other words, the only people worse than Glockta, Logan and Giselle is each other, making them endearing in comparison to the other. I like you, Inquisitor. I really do. I wouldn't be surprised if you were the only honest man left in this whole damn country. We should have a talk at some point, you and I. A talk about what I want and about what you want. It's quite telling, isn't it, when Baez considers someone a good person. It's almost like a major vote of confidence or a seal of approval, but then again, knowing Baez and his reputation, it's almost a bit ironic. If he's vouching for you, should we be impressed or a bit wary? Before we get into the history Bias reveals, I find the reactions to the magic of the House of the Maker intriguing. Glockta, Jazal, and Logan all have a strong reaction to entering the house, but Logan seems to bear it the best. Does that imply some resistance or sensitivity to it as we posited in previous chapters? Or does the fact that all three react to it to some measure impeach that theory? We also see here that the Maker's magic has the ability to warp time and space. On to history. Canadias killed Juvens with a weapon called the Divider, which looks something like a twisted axe. Seeking vengeance for Juvens' death, eleven magi assaulted the house of the Maker, two died, three did not fight. 
Baez and his allies fought Kenandaya's servants in the university. Those servants might have been Shanka, who the maker created from clay, metal, and leftover flesh. The house was home to three people, Kenedias, dead, Ptolemy, implied dead, and Jeremias. It is implied that Bias himself lived in the house at some point. Bias killed Kenedias by throwing him from the parapet of the house. Kenedias did the same to his daughter, Ptolemy, whom Bias seems to have some measure of affection for. What does it all mean? Well, there's a few things we can definitely extrapolate. The relationship between Ptolemy and Bias is undoubtedly a sore spot with Kenadias. Was Ptolemy a traitor to Kenadias? Was throwing her from the platform in an accident or a murder? Or is Bias manipulating the truth as we've seen him do already? We don't know. There are far more magi alive than I thought. Kalul did not fight, and we know he's running the Eaters in the Empire to the south. Zacharias helped train Kwai, which implies his relationship with Bias remains strong despite his absence at the House of the Maker. Corneal is a mystery. Why were these three missing? If only two magi died in the assault, where are the rest? Yoe is one, of course. This is the only chapter in which we see Glockta genuinely afraid, first by the Maker's breath and then by the impossible geography of the house. I think this shows us that the only thing Glockta fears is that which he cannot explain. Chapter 39, Nobody's Dog. Major West, lest Pharaoh and Yulve enter the Agriont, he mopes about how rough his job is, then goes home where he flies into a rage and abuses his sister, Ardi. There was nothing to be gained by losing his temper. There was never anything to be gained by that. Where we once had a beacon of heroism, we will soon have someone significantly less admirable. Abercrombie appears to suggest that everyone has flaws, and those who try hardest to seem righteous are often the least virtuous in reality. Up until this chapter, we see Artie only as someone trying to exercise her limited amount of power over the men in her life. All that changes in an instant when West turns into an abuser. The chapter starts off with West really reflecting on his situation. He seems to be in a bit of a rut, grappling with where he finds himself. We learn several important things about the state of the war effort, namely that there are not nearly enough weapons for the troops, a result of the nobles failing to provide for their levies, and no one cares except West and Marshal Burr, and only the former is going to do anything about it. There's also a fascinating back and forth between West and the commanding officer of the armory. West orders the man to make more weapons and he refuses, not only on the grounds that it's not within his responsibility, but because he refuses to take any kind of order from a commoner. This is a crucial scene to set up the second half of the chapter, where the relationship between West and Ardy comes to a head. Abercrombie shows us the pressure West is under and the impotence he feels trying to alleviate it. Finding a note from Ardy to Giselle is the catalyst, but it's this that provides the fuel to West's anger. Of all the violence in the blade itself thus far, and really there hasn't been that much given Abergrammy's reputation, West's abuse of his sister is the most gruesome in my opinion. He hits her, bounces her head off a wall several times, shakes her and chokes her. The nature of the violence isn't as significant as the ease with which he carries it out. There is no fear of retribution. When West is caught up in his intense emotions, Artie doesn't match his energy. Instead, she approaches him with this calm demeanor, almost like she's disconnected or has a dead behind the eyes look. It's not what you'd expect. Her reaction, or lack thereof, seems to snap him out of his mania. It's like her stillness contrasts so sharply with his turmoil that it jolts him back to reality. It jolts him because it reminds West of the abuse he suffered at the hands of their father. More startling, though, is that it reminds him of his guilt for leaving his sister alone in that house when he left for war. He did not rescue her from an abusive father, lying to himself that it stopped when he left. The way the author portrays the abuser in this narrative is quite skillful and nuanced. It's so well done, in fact, that it might be a bit too intense or realistic for some readers. The authenticity and depth of this portrayal could be unsettling, potentially making it a challenging read for those who find such themes difficult to engage with. Abercrombie has taken the character we most wanted to love, the commoner rising through the ranks on merit, and made him quite possibly the most loathsome individual of the bunch. Even more strangely, but as a rule, West isn't a bully, he doesn't pick on the weak to make himself feel big, almost the reverse in fact, he does have a moral sense, and that's why it's so shocking and unforgivable when he suddenly throws it aside. He has no excuse, and we can offer none for him. That's the thing about domestic abuse. While it would be comfortable to believe that it's a crime only committed by nasty, brutish types who have no moral sense and who habitually pick on those weaker than themselves, that isn't always true, and Abercrombie doesn't let us have that perhaps more comfortable perception of West. 
Instead, he makes it clear that given the right set of circumstances, West is capable of such abhorrent behavior, and he follows it up with scenes where West does the right thing or struggles valiantly to do the right thing or otherwise engages our sympathy, though we are never allowed to forget this incident or the potential that something like it could happen again. West is never allowed to become a caricature or a cartoon of an abuser. In that way, it's all the more shocking and even unflinching a portrayal of the reality of domestic abuse. It isn't a crime restricted to drunken, uneducated bullies with a tendency to solve every problem with their fists. It is worse than that. Gut-turning and triggering Nobody's Dog turns out to be a deeply disturbing title to a deeply disturbing chapter. Chapter 40. Each Man Worships Himself Pharaoh is ushered in to see Baez and Logan. She's entirely unimpressed. After eavesdropping on a conversation between Baez and Yobei, she tries to escape their clutches, but only becomes more convinced that they're her best chance at revenge. Remember, Baez, there are worse things than Kalul, far worse. His voice dropped to a whisper, and Pharaoh's trained to hear. The tellers of secrets are always listening. The what? The sons of Eos, so great in wisdom and power. This seed was the end of them, of all of them, in different ways. Are you wiser than Juven's Bias? Are you more cunning than Canadias? Are you stronger than Glustrod? Glustrod? Eos' third child mentioned thus far? We know nothing of him to this point, but given the importance of Juven's and Canadias, I suspect we'll get more. This clearly speaks to Bias's arrogance, though. He would succeed where greater individuals have failed, and Yulwe follows him. Curious. The chapter reveals a large part of Baez's plan, something about the seed, finding it, carrying it, and doing something with it. The question that underscores all of it, though, is why, and more obviously, what's the seed? Ostensibly, Baez and Yue are hinting at the idea that they have to beat Kalul to the punch. He's arming hundreds of eaters and controls a fleet to rival the unions. But what does Kalul want? Does he want the house of the maker or merely to dominate the world? Is Baez's interest to stave off Kalul's evil or does he merely seek to preserve his own authority? Or is there something larger at play? Questions, questions. And Glockta isn't handy to torture them out of anyone for us. The overload of world building and constant name dropping in the story feels more like torture than enlightenment. At this point, it's a lot to take in and not in the most comprehensible way. That aside, we learn many things in this chapter. Yulwei offers that the seed was the end of all the sons of Eos in one form or another, but in breaking the second law, Kalul threatens Baez, and Baez will break the first law to win. Interestingly, Yulwei seems to imply that the art, which we've taken to mean magic, breaks the first law. If Yulwei is willing to criticize Baez for his use of the art, why did Yulwei use to hide Pharaoh from pursuit and then defeat the eaters? Yulwei is unconvinced that Path Baez travels is the right one and he suspects the other magi will share his concern. His trust in Baez is strong though, based at least primarily on his successful coup against Canadias eons ago. What is clear is that Logan and Pharaoh will bear the brunt of Baez's schemes. Logan for his ability to commune with the spirits, and Pharaoh for her blood, which will allow her to carry the seed. In this chapter, I think we're beginning to see Baez's strategy of win at all costs. Now begins the speculation. What about Pharaoh allows her to carry the seed? We know three things that indicate her qualifications. Pain resistance, rapid healing, and an inability to see color. This implies she's not entirely human, or rather she's not merely human. Is she somehow part of the line of Eos, a product of the other side that Baez and Yulwe speak of? How does that connect to Logan's ability to speak to spirits? Are they connected at all? I don't know. I just can't wait for the group to finally get on the road. Chapter 41. Old Friends Glockta is interrupted late at night by his old friend Major Colin West. The pair reminisce about the old days, acknowledging they haven't spoken for nine years. West has come to Glockta with a request. Watch over Artie. Fury rises in Glockta and he throws his pain in West's face, demanding to know where he was when Glockta needed him, broken and alone after the war. West wonders at Glockta's reaction. He visited, but was turned away by the Inquisitor's mother, who always resented her son's relationship with the common-born soldier. Rocked by the news, Glockta re-evaluates his relationship with West and agrees to look in on Artie. The pair bond over what appears to be shared self-loathing and they separate on good terms. Sometimes, when old friends meet, things are instantly as they were all those years before. The friendship resumes, untouched, as though there had been no interruption. Sometimes, but not now. This is such a great quote. We all have friendships like that, incapable of withering from time and distance. They are usually our earliest bonds. Lockta's reaction here says a lot about how much he was hurt by West's absence. Ruse, that's the one. I'd forgotten all about him. Ruse, he could tell a story like no one else, that man. We'd sit up all night listening to him, all of us rolling with laughters. Whatever became of him? 
Right when we start to think lockdown might not be a cold-hearted bastard, we get this little nugget. The man tortured and framed and extorted one of his friends and never batted an eyelash. In this chapter, we learn that Glockta wasn't just a hero, he was a savior. West left him behind to face the Gurkish alone, seemingly to hold a bridge while the Union army retreated. He expected to die, except he didn't, and he resents not dying almost as much as he resents the people who let him stay behind in the first place. There's a fantastic juxtaposition in this chapter between the two men when Glockta realizes West suffers from the same malady he does, self-loathing. Where a moment ago it was West appeasing Glockta, the script flips and Glockta is soothing West and making a good effort at it. Who knew? Chapter 42. Back to the Mud Dogman and the crew wait outside Carleon. It's a changed city surrounded by walls. If Forley goes in and Bethod keeps him, they'll never get him back. Even still, Forley has to go. To not warn of the Shanka threat is anathema to the personal honor of Logan's former squad. The crew waits for Bethod's answer. It comes in the form of Badenov and his entourage. They come with the cart and Forley's head in a sack. At the sight of their dead mate's head, the crew attacks, butchering the king's men. With a fight over, Three Trees makes an announcement. He'll have Bethod's blood and he'll join the Union to get it. Who's coming with him? Sometimes weakness is a better shield than strength, the dogman reckoned. It takes some bones to meet your death as well as he did, to walk to it with no complaint, to ask for it, and not for his own sake, but for others that he didn't even know. We often see an honoring of self-sacrifice in fantasy. There's definitely some of that here with Abercrombie, and it comes off a little sappy relative to the tone of the characters in almost every other situation. It's strange, right after the chapter where we see Glockta dismiss his own self-sacrifice as a foolish act of pride, we get this conflicting message. It leaves us wondering what's the real take here. Is self-sacrifice something admirable or just a pointless gesture? Despite Forley's failed efforts, it's clear he was the crew's puppy. Without him, they are somewhat less like human beings. Dogman sees a tear roll down Black Dow's cheek over the grave. This is worth remembering as we'll see how it affects him going forward. There's also something interesting in the opening bit where Dogman is observing the progress in the northern capital. It's larger with walls and buildings and order. It's all the things that Carlio never was before Bethod. Does tyranny bring order? Is it desirable? Should progress trump morality? It's subtle, but I absolutely think Abercrombie is inviting the reader to engage in this conversation, particularly given the corrupt nature of the political scene in Adua. I've gotten so used to chapters that are all about developing characters that actual combat is unexpected. In fact, almost all of the combat chapters have been Dogman's point of view as opposed to Logan or Giselle, and certainly extended fight scenes are almost exclusively Dogman's domain. Odd, right? This is supposed to be a series famous for brutal violence and we actually see very little of it. But when we do, the violence is more visceral than in other fantasy novels. Chapter 43. Misery. Giselle waits for Artie at the foot of the Agriant. He's, of course, put out by her tardiness because what kind of woman would keep a man like Giselle and Luther waiting, but he cannot imagine wanting to wait for someone more. Artie arrives, bruised and bloodied from her brother's violence, on her guard attempting to distance herself from Giselle, who's about to leave for England and war. He denies her efforts and asks her to wait for him because he loves her. Artie agrees to wait. In the harbor, Giselle waits on a ship to depart for war. Before the ship sets sail, a messenger arrives on High Justice Morovia's orders and sends Giselle to the Agriant. The first of the Magi invites Giselle, a world-class swordsman, to join his adventure to the edge of the world. He agrees to John Baez as if he had a choice. It was ridiculous the power she had over him. The difference between misery and happiness was the right word from her. The chapter opens with Giselle and Artie kind of resolving the narrative arc of their relationship around which a lot of the blade itself is based. Remember, Artie is the primary motivating force for Giselle throughout the novel and the central figure in Major West's ongoing battle with himself. Even Glockta's willingness to take her under his wing a few chapters ago is an emotional reconnection for a character who's been exclusively inward focused for a decade. And how do Artie and Giselle resolve things? Like everything in an Abercrombie novel, it's complicated. The fact this final chapter is stalled from Giselle's point of view and not Artie's is fascinating because we're left with an extremely inexact view of the nature of the pair's relationship. Giselle desperately wants her to wait for him, but wait for what? He recognizes that marriage with her is impossible and surely she knows the same. Is she in denial or is she merely toying with him? Her reactions interpreted through Giselle's biased point of view seem to indicate a level of bittersweet affection. She's resigned to things ending badly as they always do in her cursed existence, but seems to take a live and that live philosophy of enjoying what little happiness she can carve out. Also make note of the chapter title, Misery. Abercrombie seems to be equating love, or at least the version of love Artie and Giselle are resigned to, not to traditional adjectives, but to one with a negative connotation. It's reinforced by this quote. 
Giselle is defining love by his lover's capacity to inflict pain on him. I also wanted to highlight this quote, I and a few brave companions, chosen people you understand, people of quality, are engaging on a great journey, an epic voyage, a great adventure. I have little doubt that, should we be successful, there will be stories told of this for years to come, very many years. This is the Fellowship of the Ring moment, or in terms of the hero's journey as defined by Joseph Campbell, the call to adventure. It's a trope that's built into epic fantasy but often occurs in the first act. Abercrombie saves it till the waning moments of the first novel, preparing for it with thousands of words of character development. The reader knows how ill-suited the group is for the role Bias places them in, how unheroic they all are. We also know that the things Bias promises, a great journey, an epic voyage, a great adventure, are also probably misleading. More reminders that while Abercrombie spins a fascinating character-driven narrative, the blade itself flips the script on the typical call to adventure narrative. Chapter 44, The Bloody Nine. Bias storms in and demands to know where Pharaoh has run off to. Logan is tasked with tracking her down. He finds her surrounded by three men threatening her to come with them. Evaluating the situation, Logan can tell it will come to blows and leaps to his new teammate's defense. Once the three are subdued, Logan asks what Pharaoh has done, but she has no explanation. Before they can catch their breath, more men appear, led by a woman with short red hair. Eventually, they find themselves trapped and surrounded. Logan takes a beating and finds himself on the verge of death when something comes over him and the bloody Nine takes hold. The change turns the tide of the battle and Logan lays waste to the attackers. When the fury leaves him, Logan is left shattered, bleeding and weak. Pharaoh helps him back to Bias, the practicals track them there and insist on arresting Pharaoh before Bias turns one of them into pink mist. The Magi commands the group to help Logan to his feet, they're leaving immediately. Killing weapons, meant to kill. Well, so much the better, Logan told himself. If you say one thing for Logan Nine Figures, and one thing only, say he's a killer. Logan might have pitied him, but Logan was far away, and the Bloody Nine had no more pity in him than the winter, less even. So obviously this chapter cannot be discussed, and frankly there isn't much else in it to discuss without addressing the question of are Logan and the Bloody Nine two separate and distinct entities? In other words, are Logan and the Bloody Nine the same person, two distinct people in one body, a split personality, or something else altogether? There isn't much evidence to support any of those theories just yet, but we can speculate. First, it shows that Logan is aware that another presence lives inside him, regardless of how or why it manifests. We know that Logan sees himself as a weapon, a means of destruction, well before he's overtaken by the berserking alter ego. We also know that Logan, as himself, feels pain and weakness. He's strong, but not inhumanely. Even the more minor wounds he takes defending Pharaoh have real consequences on his capacity to fight. The kicker though is that once Logan becomes the Bloody Nine, all that becomes irrelevant. He is fierce, displaying superhuman strength and pain tolerance. His voice even seems to change as he becomes some force of nature imbued with supernatural abilities. Oddly, Logan does retain some measure of self-awareness. He can communicate and express himself. When Stone Splitter challenges the Bloody Nine's claim to the name, Logan responds with laughter and not rage, but not at first. When the Bloody Nine leaves Logan, it's like all the bones have been taken from his body and he melts into bruised and battered exhaustion. Is this merely the result of the cumulative damage Logan's body has taken, or is it similar to the exhaustion that Baez experiences after his magical activities? Final chapter, chapter 45, The Tools We Have. Glockta approaches the West home. In Ardy, Glockta sees something of himself, and the two come to a mutual understanding of sorts regarding his concern for her welfare. His next stop is the Archlector's office, where he awaits his commander's attention with Vitari, the practical, most recently trounced by Logan Ninefingers. Glockta finds the Archlector chewing Superior Goyle out for botching the arrest of Pharaoh. With Goyle gone, Sol reveals that Superior Devost in Dagoska has disappeared. In Dagoska, the situation is deteriorating. Sol charges Glockta, the new Superior of Dagoska, with discovering what's wrong in the south and defending Union soil against possible Gurkish incursion. Despite his reticence, Glockta accepts. To protect him, Salt attaches six more practicals to his staff, including Vitari. As the pair leave, Glockta relishes walking with someone in as much pain as he is, wondering all the while, why do I do this? Why? I know how you feel. I'm such a fool. I knock half my teeth out and hack my leg to useless pulp. Look at me now. A cripple. It's amazing where a little foolishness can take you if it goes unchecked. We clumsy types should stick together, don't you think? Right off the bat, Ardy and Glockta seem to find common ground. She's completely unbowed by his deformities and he's completely at ease with her crudeness. Not to mention both have spent a lifetime trying to live in agony, either physical or emotional. I'm curious to see where is this relationship going. Has one man ever had such a range of deaths to choose from? The corner of his mouth twitched up. I can hardly wait to get started.
This chapter ends when Glockta asks, why do I do this? It's clear why though, isn't it? He's extremely driven by challenges, by proving himself, whether it's the contest in his youth or against the Gurkish on that bridge or by taking on an entire nation as a politician, Glockta wants to win. So ends the first book of the first law trilogy, and it ends with the beginning of the journey, Glockta on his way to the Gosca to relieve a missing superior and Baez's team of misfits heading off to the old empire for deceit. The inverse nature of that from a narrative perspective is absolutely in line with what we've experienced so far throughout this read of the blade itself. Abercrombie seals it with the final line, why do I do this, why? It's a question not often asked in fantasy, or rather it's a question often with an easy answer. I do this to save the world, I do this because I must. But here Glocktech has really none of that. He seems to bear no loyalty to the crown beyond the fact that it provides him with interesting challenges. His pain is such that death, or inactivity at least, would be a relief. His why is a far more challenging a question. I would posit Glockta's why is because saving the world, or in this case the very petty and corrupt union, is something to keep his mind off how awful his future looks. There is no goodness in that decision, it's merely a human decision, a very authentic human decision. The same is true of Logan throughout the book, and Pharaoh too. They agree to Baez's plan, not out of a sense of duty, but because they are making the best decisions for themselves that are left to make. In that, despite all the evidence of darkness and grimness and grit and grime, the blade itself is a novel of humanity. It's a novel of people dragging themselves the last inch when it would be so much easier to roll over and give up. There's something powerful in that. Final thoughts. When considering this book, it's essential to acknowledge the boldness of Joe Abercrombie's debut, as this was his first published novel. To write an entire novel that isn't actually a complete story in itself, in fact it's not much more than the first half of a first act, introducing the characters and the world and then ending before they actually do anything of note. When diving into a first novel, it's quite common to see the author's potential simmering beneath the surface, even if it hasn't fully blossomed. Abercrombie manages to rise above the basic expectations one might have for a debut author. His skill as a writer shines through, offering glimpses of the depth and mastery he could achieve in future works. That said, the novel isn't without its shortcomings. While Abercrombie's storytelling prowess is evident, the construction of the world and the book's pacing don't quite hit the mark for me, but the skill on display just in terms of the language used and the deft manipulation of our expectations is fantastic. That said, I can still remember the palpable disappointment I felt when it became apparent that nothing really much was going to happen at the end of this book. I can't call it a flaw per se because A, as I just mentioned, I admired the bravery, and B, where else would he end it? Earlier, midway through the next book, Still, I remember being slightly frustrated by it. My expectations were aligned when I started reading the book. I knew it was a character-driven book, as it was often referenced. However, I was still stunned with how little happens, and I would say that the narrative is based not so much on character development as it is on character establishment. This feels like a prologue to the trilogy, and in no way attempting to be a complete novel that stands on its own. However, therein lies the issue. The pacing in Abercrombie's book, subtle as it may be, does impact the urge to immediately pick up the next one. It seems like the storylines involving Baez and the Union aren't grabbing my interest as much. My fascination lies more with Glockta, whose arc is intriguing and well-crafted. This disparity in character development is quite evident. Glockta being a standout in the narrative overshadows other characters for me, leading to a lack of interest in other parts of the story like the Seed and the Magi, I couldn't care less about that. It's a tricky balance for an author to maintain, and in this case it seems like the compelling nature of Glockta's character has made other perspectives less appealing to me. I really liked the first part of the book where it took its time establishing the characters, even though not much was happening plot-wise, but then when the second part started, I was hoping for everything to ramp up in quality, instead the focus shifted from character development to a plot that felt somewhat insignificant and uninteresting. This change was accompanied by less interesting points of views, which was a bit of a letdown after the promising start. I had to force myself to work through the second part, and by the end of the book I grew bored and a bit jaded. I also felt a lot of the violence and pain in this book was making too much of an effort. I have nothing against explicit descriptions of what weaponry actually does, again in contrast with some very banal fantasy cliches, but it needs to serve the story, not just be there for shock value. After reading the first book, I also don't think of the author as revolutionary as some would. While it is nice to subvert the stereotypes, it eventually becomes expected that this will happen and then the reader can stop being impressed. It gets to the point of feeling forced, he does come off as trying too hard to be edgy and greedy sometimes. So while I might read the second book in the trilogy, I'm not going to rush to get it. And so we conclude Joe Abercrombie's The Blade Itself book club. When I began creating this video, I had no idea it would take this long, nor did I have any concept of how much I would enjoy the journey, no matter what I think of the book. 
So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and tell me if you like this book club concept or if you enjoy the video essay type of content more. Also, please share your thoughts in the comments. Should I tackle a second book or do you have other books in mind? And hey, if you're still here with me, a huge thanks. Your support is incredible. Thank you so much. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. This was Heads and Tails. Talk to you in the next one.